jetzt fangen wir. Welcome in, ladies and gentlemen, to the Air Raid Hour. My name is Steve Mathis. You can find me on Twitter at Judge at Judge Mathis. Joined, as always, by my co-host, Dave Tilton. You can find him on Twitter at Tilt Money. And as per usual in draft season, we got Kendall Mersky. You can find him on Twitter at Mersky Kendall. And surprise, we're bringing in the big guns for hmm. this episode as we break hmm. down quarterbacks. It's Anthony Prohaska. You can find him on Twitter at Pro underscore Anth. He is the host of disguise coverage as well as one of the hosts of the cover one film room you can catch him on tuesday and wednesday nights here on cover one uh so gentlemen first of all we are brought to you by picasso's pizza head on over to picasso's pizza.net they got four great western new york locations williamsville west seneca lancaster and blaisdale head over online you can order pickup or delivery if you're out of range they got the door dash option for you if you're out of town or out of state, you can still get that great Buffalo, New York pizza, ordering frozen pizzas delivered right to your right to your door, that cup and char, pepperoni, that deliciousness, all the way across the continental U.S., Picasso's Pizza.net, they got you covered, and they are the flagship sponsor of this show. All right, gentlemen, we are 18 days away from the NFL draft. How are we feeling? Are we feeling... Uh, the word I'm feeling right now is unprepared. What word would we <laughs> use to describe how we feel uh, 18 days from the NFL draft? Dave, I'll start with you. What word are we feeling right now to describe uh, where we're at in our draft prep right now? Well, I mean, this is the last of our position by position yeah. big board shows, right? So we've come a long way since right after the Super Bowl, right? We dove into the Senior Bowl. And from there on out, from there on, other than a little blip of free agency, mm -hmm. it's pretty much been draft talk for mm -hmm. a good two plus months uh, here at the Air Raid Hour. A lot of draft talk on Twitter. And like I said, we're rounding out the the cornerback um, big board tonight, which will round out the entire the entire draft for us. And then um, so for me now, it's going to be after tonight going back reaffirming some of the things I had written down notes wise for position groups. We covered a while back, checking in on a few more names that maybe have come up recently, seeing what that's all about risers, fallers, and really kind of getting myself prepped for draft coverage and kind of setting my boards mm -hmm. and making sure I've got everything in order to, so that we can bring you guys the best coverage possible when it comes to the actual mm -hmm. draft. So it's good that we're rounding this out now because it gives me a couple weeks to do that. But it's going to feel like a, a, a long time. I mean, we're talking it's, what, two weeks from Thursday. Mm -hmm. That's going to be a long two weeks. Yeah, no, I, I'll tell you what. Like, we, we've we done all of our position breakdowns tonight. It's the final night. We got cornerback. Uh, we'll throw punchers in there probably when we do day three uh, of our, <laughs> like, day three favorites. We'll throw punters in there. We will we will get to some punter talk. Um, but, you know, we, I mean, we've talked about hundreds of prospects <laughs> on this show. We've we Our, our goal was just name drop them all. So that way we can go back and clip it later and <laughs> pretend like they were the only ones we were talking about. But I'll tell you what, every every single day I get on Twitter and it's like this kid from Mississauga State University Community College at, you know, the Culinary Institute of whatever had this scored his pro day. And now he's on NFL draft boards. And I'm like, shit, I miss that guy. Like, what? Like, who is it? Who is this person? Like, there, I mean, there are thousands of names that are technically eligible for this NFL draft. And it's, it's honestly crazy. That's one of the things I think I've been working on is, is like, all right, you don't need to know them all. If someone takes you by surprise, that's okay. Just know the big ones. Uh, just know the first 300. You're good. Uh, Anthony, how about you? How are you feeling so far in your draft coverage? <sighs> Exhausted. That's my word. Um, <laughs> I've been so down the rabbit hole with I, I try to go for each position grouping and then depending on how good the class is 
how and, and then by by extension how important that position grouping mm-hmm. is to the bills i usually go anywhere from like 10 to 17 deep and when i say deep it's anywhere from three to five full games of film um varying varying the games based on the competition that they they faced and then like their their best game their worst game statistically depending on what position they play and trying to figure things out and my eyes hurt um hmm. i don't it, we were talking earlier it might be allergies or it might be just because like the blue screen hmm. has just burned my retina i am exhausted and so i i love the draft always have i'm very excited for it to come about um but i'm very much looking forward to when it's over not having hmm. to grind tape just for the, hours uh, and hours the, the, the hibernation that will come uh that will come after uh, the NFL yes. draft. And we get yes. uh, Doug Master saying this draft is unique because it's the COVID opt out year. So yeah. you have all these. Ex- so last year it was kind of like really simple. It's like after the first like 10 guys, each position it was like, there's no one left this year. Uh, it is deep and it's like 20, 25 deep at almost every position. So pretty crazy year, uh, especially getting prepared for this draft. Kendall, how are we feeling? Giddy. I want it to be here already. I, I want it to happen mm-hmm. for similar reasons. Like I, I I'm kind of like a mix between all of it because I want it to be over so I can just grind the tape on the dudes, mm-hmm. the bills actually draft and not just grind tape on dudes that are going to be playing for like the Patriots or something. Um, but I mean, I also feel somewhat unprepared. Like there's so many names that just don't have colored mm-hmm. fillings on my spreadsheet. And that means I haven't touched them yet. <laughs> and it's just like, it. Uh, I'm in the same boat as you judge where it's like, I want to know something about everyone. So if the bills draft them mm-hmm. I can say something, but you're just not going to get that. Well, you're not going to get to every single prospect. It's just not possible. But I mean, we, we do the best that we can over here and we, we try to provide you with some deep coverage and some shallow coverage and some coverage that'll at least get anyone <laughs> familiar with anything we have to say about, any prospect so that's kind of what we pride ourselves on the diversification of our coverage mm. here it's it I always, think comes, it always comes I, back to gabriel davis for me yeah not, exactly not having anything to say for him when he was drafted just haunts me yeah <laughs> oh my gosh well i i think what kendall said is so true though right because you guys with with the film breakdown like anthony said like like there's only so many hours in the day, right? When you're going 17 deep on one position, that that's a ton of hours, right? And so like what Kendall said about diversifying the type of coverage, like Steve and I probably do more of like the bullet points on guys, get our affirmations or non affirmations from you guys who watch the film, but you guys have like such in-depth knowledge of so many of these guys that, it's impossible for you to get to 300, 400 Never guys. And so mm-hmm. it's just like that blend of like, okay, if you're 10, 15 deep at each position that the bills inevitably or, or on the surface, at least appear to need, I really hope like at least like th- four or five mm-hmm. of those guys you covered in film are guys, the bills yep. end up drafting because yep. then you can go back and really bring that back to the fo- forefront. Right. <laughs> Whereas for me and Steve, it's more about like probably looking for traits and things that might fit with the bills, guys that we like athletic, whatever. And then getting you guys to really help us kind of affirm what we see just from watching games and things like that. So it is helpful, uh, immensely helpful for for everyone yeah. out there to see what you guys do. It, it, it'll be like a Tuesday night and I'll be watching. I'll be watching the cover one film room and my wife will just be like, well, why are you watching that? Isn't that like, or isn't that just like your show? They're just using different words. And I'm like, no, <laughs> it's, it's completely different. <laughs> they, they are going way more in depth. They are way more nuanced and I am learning a lot from them. So uh, I need their show more than anyone uh, needs my show. We're like, we're at the point of draft season where, my wife wakes up at like three in the morning and she'll roll over and I'm just like watching Brett Coleman on YouTube. And she's like, what are you doing? <laughs> like, I can't sleep. I can't sleep. I got to watch Brett uh, Coleman. It's that, Wolverine down East West Shrine prospect. It's, it's that Wolverine <laughs> picture and you've got like Brett Coleman on your <laughs> <laughs> Just him breaking down Taekwon Thornton. Uh, um, oh, you're all right. right. Just, yeah. Oh, I can't. I, I love, I love Taekwon Thornton. Uh, every day someone has something nice to say about Taekwon Thornton. Every day mm-hmm. someone finds something new. Yeah, there's some, say about there's so some buzz. about Thornton. So I like to think that I started it. Um, <laughs> so I, it's not, it wasn't as 428 at the combine. It, it was me. I was the one <laughs> who started uh, the Taekwon Thornton buzz. But uh, just a couple of notes from, you know, I would say around the league, but just a couple of uh, uh, notes to get here before we hop into cornerbacks. John Mechie 
visiting with the Buffalo Bills today. Top 30 visit uh, speed slot from Alabama recovering from that torn ACL. Head on over to CoverOne.net. And uh, there was a great piece by Banged Up Bills uh, breaking down that John Mechie injury. Uh, it's also on the pre-draft tracker that you can find over on the Cover One website. Dylan Parnum also in town. Uh, so we have an offensive guard that is one of Kendall's favorites uh, in town. Taking a picture of that world-class weight room. Uh, it really it must suck for prospects going from that Buffalo weight room, seeing some of the other shitholes that some of these teams <laughs> were playing. Uh, and then uh, last but not least, the Buffalo Bills re-signed Bobby Hart. We're just not going to talk about Ooh, it. Gonna, it. We're just going to pretend like it didn't happen. I'm not even going to put I'm not even gonna put him on my offseason tracker, and I'm not even going to put him on the depth chart. Um, but we digress. roster for that reason. <laughs> So moving on now, our goal today is to break down the cornerback draft board. We're going to go round by round. We're going to talk about who we like, who we think are the best fits for the Buffalo Bills, and where we think the best value is for the Buffalo Bills in the 2022 NFL draft. I'm going to start here by putting the Buffalo Bills depth chart, not the offensive line because we're not going to talk about that, but the Buffalo Bills secondary up here. We're not going to focus on the safeties like we did on the last show. We're going to focus on the corners. Pretty much what the Buffalo Bills have going for them right now. On the boundary, you have Trey White, Dane Jackson. You could probably consider Cam Lewis inside-outside flex, Nick McLeod, Elijah Griffin, and Tim Harris. And then uh, on the inside in the slot, you really have Teron Johnson, Saran Neal. And then again, sort of that flex player, that chess piece that you can move around a little bit. You have Cam Lewis from the <laughs> State University of New York at Buffalo. Uh, one word to describe this depth chart, gentlemen, thin. So yeah. I know you don't want to draft for need, but looking at this draft class and the depth of it, do you have a round where after that you would be disappointed if the Bills haven't addressed the cornerback position yet? Dave, I'm going to start with you. Like, Where is the, sort of, uh, the, the line of demarcation here where the Buffalo Bills got to take a corner in this draft? You know, I'd like to see before we're at a day two, uh, at least addressed mm -hmm. once, right? Um, I think, I mean, for me, it's all going to depend on how the board falls, obviously, on day one. But I think between rounds one, two, and three, I'd like to see that position addressed, right? We're now, like you said, 18 days away from the draft. At this point, yes, the Bills could go out and still sign a veteran before the draft, and that may maybe move the, the priority down somewhat. But, like, at this point in free agency, you're not going out and signing a guy that's really you, you really should expect to count on to be your CB2 mm -hmm. necessarily all year. We saw the Bills have done this in the past, even before the draft, where like in the in past years they've signed guys like Josh Norman and then they've rotated him with like the yeah. likes of Levi Wallace and wherever. So I, I like what a lot of people are saying here. Round three, I think day one or day two at this point for me, I would love to see it addressed. And to be honest, it's a position where I wouldn't mind seeing the Bills double dip as well, right? A day, uh, a day one or two pick, and then maybe a day th day three guy somewhere in the mix there, just because the the class to me does seem deep. I like a lot of guys in this class. I think there's certain guys that offer like some unique characteristics, and for me, just the way this roster is setting up right now, you have to look at it and say, mm -hmm. look. Day one or day two has to be it. A lot of people, I think Anthony, if I recall, you were probably one of them. I know Bruce was, Steve, you were. We won a corner last year in round one, right? Yep. Like it was Asante Samuel <laughs> Jr. It was Greg Newsom. It was whoever it was. Stop right? mentioning them. Stop. <laughs> <laughs> and they didn't do it. And that was with Levi Wallace, right? Mm -hmm. And that was mm -hmm. with uh, Dane Jackson. This year is a lot different. Right. And Trey White coming off injury. So you have Trey White coming off injury, Levi Wallace not there, and Dane Jackson pretty much I, I feel like is if anything slightly you have slightly more confidence in in him this going into this year than you did last year because it was a pretty much an unknown last year but it's very thin like you said and I think that word describes it perfectly mm -hmm. day one or day two for me got to address Anthony how about you where's sort of that line of demarcation for you where that you feel like the Buffalo Bills have to draft a corner in this draft if there is a line for you I have a tentative line still in <laughs> round one. I really want a round one corner. I really, really do. But I understand the way, you know, yeah. to Tilt's point, like the way the board falls. Like if if there's a run on corner, 
And if two quarterbacks go, like there's a legit chance that a stud receiver or potentially Zion Johnson falls or Mm -hmm. like one of these other positions of need that are on the Bills board that isn't really a need, but where they could upgrade at combined with a top like blue chip level prospect that falls. Like I'd be very happy with that. Um, But I'll second Tilt's uh, line of demarcation. If the Bills don't come away with a corner in the first three rounds. So by the end of day two, I, I would, I would be disappointed. Not that they can't get someone in, you know, round four, I think, you know, again, to tilt point, he was spot on. There is a lot of flavor in this corner class as there really is for a lot of the positions in this draft. And there are very traitsy and toolsy and skill set type of guys that, you know, you could make the case for, okay, the bills, you know, the proverbial come to Buffalo and become the best version of yourself. And you take this traitsy guy and, put them with a coaching staff that has been able to squeeze blood from a stone for the Levi Wallace's of the world and able to elevate floors and ceilings of players. And so I can understand, um, you know, going with a little bit towards the middle of the draft for it, but yeah, I, I, I would be, I would be not pleased uh, to say the <laughs> least if they didn't come away with a corner in the first three rounds. Ken, how about you? Where's where, where are you drawing the line here? I'm the same where I draw that line at round three, but for the sake of talking about it a little bit differently, I would say if the bills don't draft a cornerback in the first two rounds, I want a double dip. If that Mm. first cornerback is taken in the third round, I would prefer to have two cornerbacks taken in the draft. If there's a premier cornerback taken in the first two rounds, I feel comfortable addressing kind of spreading the wealth and addressing needs everywhere opposed to double dipping at the position. But yeah, that that's kind of where it it lies for me that that value of it. If if we wait, you know, that lottery ticket isn't necessarily uh, guaranteed to hit if it's a third round pick. So I'd like a second chance, a second chance at that positional lottery ticket. Go for it again on sometime on day three. Yes, question, Anthony. <laughs> if I want to raise my hand, make sure because uh, I know Steve's a teacher. I figured this would get the easiest way to get the <laughs> Um, if so, say that scenario happens for you, when would you like to see the second corner taken? in that scenario probably not right away so like if if that first corner is taking around three Mm -hmm. i wouldn't want to see the next one taking around four because i think then you're you're putting it all like too closely together i would like to spread that wealth a little bit and you know say you wait on interior offensive linemen you go round three corner round four interior offensive linemen instead of a massive drop off for interior offensive linemen in round five or six or whatever the hypothetical is. So yeah, I would, I would like to spread it a little bit more. I do think that both of them need to be before round five, because I do think, I do think if you're going to double dip and you want both guys to have like maybe a legitimate chance to compete and start and contribute. I do think as Brandon Bean noted, as I go through these positions, man, I think every position, but like running back, there is a steep drop off after the fifth round. Like I just like, and I think running backs, obviously, like I think probably a different position because they play in a rotation, all these different things, but Mm -hmm. there is just such a steep decline at at almost every single position. Once you get late fourth, early fifth round type of uh, projections, but a good question here from Chris Kepner, he comes in, he says, tilt as an NC state guy. Can we get your thoughts on Nick McLeod? Watch him in Notre Dame. Have a feeling the bills are higher than him on. We are, you have Nick McLeod. You also have, obviously, Dane Jackson coming back. Uh, Mm -hmm. And you even have a guy in Elijah Griffin, who a lot of people um, had a draftable grade on in terms of like what they saw on film, but didn't have a draftable grade on body type because he's obviously a a very diminutive stature, Elijah Griffin. But we haven't seen Elijah Griffin like we, we don't we don't see him. I, I checked on the social media. He doesn't post a lot or anything. Who knows? He could have spent the last year going ham in the Buffalo Bills weight room. And I understand that there's only so much he can do to improve his frame, but maybe he is building up his body and getting more NFL body ready. And you can have a guy like Elijah Griffin, who was had maybe the tape of a fourth, fifth rounder in the body of a UDFA. Now maybe have that tape of a fourth, fifth rounder and have a more NFL compatible body. The bill signed him to a two year contract. So mm. Dave, I'll start with you. Like, what are your thoughts on McLeod and some of these deeper pieces? Even if you want to throw like a Tim Harris in there. I would say that I I'm I'm fine with them, right? I think I, that's mm-hmm. the, the best way I can describe it. I'm fine with them. I like Nick McLeod. Yes, he did. He has had a couple big injuries in his past, but he's overcome them and played pretty well. Um, I think he has the right sort of um, path, if you will, to proving himself and kind of 
he's the type of guy you would want in your locker room as far, as far as overcoming adversity with the transfer and then obviously making it all the way now to the NFL. But those are the t- type of guys I like kind of where they are on the practice squad, emergency type situations only in a year where maybe Trey White wasn't coming off an, an injury and you had another, you know, cornerback, veteran cornerback in the room to bring these guys along. I maybe feel a little bit better about it, but like what is Trey going to be able to do right now to bring these guys along? He mm-hmm. can't do it on the field. Dane Jackson's still a young player. Mm-hmm. Nick McLeod's a young player. Elijah Griffin's a young player. Who is going to be that guy? in the room to kind of bring these guys along and and kind of set the example. That's where I get thrown a little bit. Now I'm not saying it can't be done and I'm not saying one of these guys can't crack the roster because they certainly could. And they certainly would have a a track to if the bills for some reason do not address corner in this draft. But um, I would probably say like, let's not get our hopes up too much about guys like McLeod and, and, and Griffin, right? right yet right mm-hmm. let's see how they handle themselves in camp they'll obviously be there but i think it's you know it's one of those things last off season brandon bean mentioned dane jackson by name right he mentioned dane jackson by name as a guy who's going to come in and compete and 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 all that they haven't mentioned any of these other guys by name right they haven't mentioned mm-hmm. anyone specifically by name yes they gave elijah griffin the two-year futures deal which i i thought was interesting mm-hmm. but you you can really never have enough corners on your roster anyway, especially on the practice squad. So I'm not reading too much into it right now. I still think the position needs to be addressed and I'm, I'm happy to have those guys, but I'm not, I'm not right now counting on them for anything. How about you guys? Are are there, is there anyone in the bottom half of this roster that you guys would stand for that you would say could be CB two or even not if they're CB two, but CB four, like, a lot of people are like, well, if the Bills draft a guy, they have to go out. They still have to sign a veteran like a Joe Hayden or or a um, a Bryce Callahan. Is there anyone who you could see, Griffin, Harris, McLeod, where, oh, we don't need a veteran because the Bills might feel confident enough in these young guys? I think for me it would be – I think you're really kind of flipping a coin between Griffin and McLeod. And, you know, I, I like Griffin's tape, you know, judged to your point, you know, the, the tenacity, the burst, the ferociousness he played with, his dad – is a regulator and that's fantastic. And there's so much <laughs> potential with that. Like I wanted it to work really bad. Um, and then, you know, McLeod, like he's got some length, he's got some speed, he's got some burst. I think what's interesting from McLeod and what's interesting with, with Chris's question. So he gets picked up off the practice squad by Cincinnati. Mm-hmm. So you have another NFL team that was like, Oh, we like this guy. We're going to take this guy. And then the bills end up getting him back. So the fact that the bills made, so the fact that he was picked up by two NFL teams in, in essence, and then the fact that the mm-hmm. Bills brought him back, I think you could make a case. Awesome comment. Regulators mount up. Fantastic. Um, <laughs> I think you could make the case that maybe there is something the Bills see in him. I'm okay with that guy mm-hmm. being like the fifth-ish option, like a tricky yeah. guy who we can potentially groom and develop and bring along. I just think with – fourth is a little high for me, and that's mm-hmm. no disrespect, I think, to any of those guys. And you're playing in – I know Tyreek Hill is not with Kansas City anymore, but Kansas City is still going to be a squad. The Chargers are a squad in terms of passing the football. The Chargers are a squad with passing the football. With the Raiders, who everybody always likes to poke fun of, Devontae Adams, Darren Waller, and Hunter Renfro are a pretty sick trio, and Derek Carr is better than people think. I just Mm -hmm. think you need more horses at the corner position and Mm -hmm. less – less hope now granted we said that last year i think a lot of people said that last year with dawson knox and that's where the whole you know get zach Ertz conversation came from and dawson knox came out this past year and delivered in a multitude of ways but i think that's a lot to hope for for someone without that proven level of production or necessary skill set overall to come in and prove to be like a solid option even even if it's towards the bottom of the depth chart the uh the last buffalo bill to be released Picked off off waivers by another team and then returned to the Bills, Ike Butker. So that might be uh, that might bode well for Mr. Cloud heading into the future. Dawson Knox was also playing in (laughs) meaningful NFL snaps too, right? Beforehand, yeah. yeah. (laughs) These guys haven't Um, played at all. We didn't mention how Nick McLeod was called up for the um, the AFC divisional round game to cover Tyreek Hill because of his speed. We didn't even talk about that, so. Uh, but we'll, we'll save that for conversation for another day. <laughs> that was sarcasm, by the way. I've, I've waxed that game be. from my brain. I better <laughs> it doesn't exist. Um, for me, my line of demarcation just quickly is the fourth round. Uh, I'm a little lower than everyone else. 
I do think that if the Bills draft right, and that's the thing, like if you wait to the fourth, you better be damn sure, right? Like yeah. that, but I do think that there will be guys with traits that could come in and plug and play right away, mm-hmm. but it's definitely more of a risk. I think in a, in a Caleb Evans, I think of a Jalen Armour Davis, a Monteric Brown, maybe even a guy like Kobe Bryant slips into the fourth round. You get me trade up in the fourth round to get him at the top end of the fourth round. I think there could be a guy that drops or there could be a couple of guys that are sitting there in the fourth round that if the Buffalo Bills feel comfortable, you know, the Buffalo Bills feel like that is their guy. They've met, they've met Kendall. You, you had a conversation with Monteric Brown and his GM DMS. He told mm-hmm. you he had a virtual meeting with the Buffalo Bills. Like if that's their guy and they feel comfortable, and confident, he's got the traits. I could easily see with Sean McDermott's history of, you mentioned Anthony, like raising ceilings, raising floors, getting a guy in the fourth round that they mm-hmm. feel completely comfortable plugging and playing. Now that'll probably mean after the draft, they go out and sign a veteran has some insurance, <laughs> but I do think that, that there is a chance that a guy as late as the fourth round could be a plug and play. If the Buffalo bills, if someone falls or if the Buffalo bills truly have someone in mind and picked out for that role later on in the draft. But I mean, they're talking with Andrew Booth jr. They met with mm-hmm. Kyler board Gordon. They met with Trent McDuffie. Like they're doing their homework on, these early round guys too. So definitely the Buffalo Bills, probably that would be worst case scenario, I think, for the uh, the Buffalo Bills. A couple of people have mentioned this now. Uh, Richard Rush says, I'd be willing to bet we take two cornerbacks in the first five rounds. We've even gotten a Beal coming in and he mentions Dax Hill as a guy who could start at corner and then uh, move to safety. Uh, we had that sort of co- a Dax Hill conversation on the last show, but here's what I want to talk about. If the Buffalo Bills do make the decision to double dip at cornerback. I would personally like to see the second guy have some safety flex to his game with the future of the Buffalo Bills, like Poyer Hyde long-term sort of in question guys like Cam Taylor, Britt, Alante Taylor, Kobe Bryant. Those are the biggest sort of names I can think of in the middle ish rounds of the draft that stand out in that regard where they could possibly play a little bit of corner, play a little bit of nickel, play a little bit of safety. You can sort of move them around as a chess piece in the secondary, find the right spot for them. Which of these guys, maybe in the middle rounds of the draft, do you have pegged as someone who you might be high on to maybe start at corner, but a couple of years down the road, make that transition to the safety position? I'll I'll reverse the order here, and Kendall, I'll start with you. Mm Uh, of that list, the list, I, I would definitely go with Alante Taylor. You can I think throw your own out there one, too. So if the you got only someone one, else, the only one person I would add to that, and he's not a middle rounder is Kyler Gordon. I think his mm-hmm. skill set actually Ooh. translates very well to safety because of how he comes up physically and plays the run. I, I think he's someone that would translate very well to safety if he didn't pan out a corner, but I think he's going to pan out a corner. So I, it's kind of a moot point. So I'll move on to Alante Taylor because I think he's more likely to kind of fizzle out at corner. And I think he'd be really good at safety with how downhill he plays at corner. And sometimes that's not the greatest thing when you're trying to set the edge against the run. Uh, You don't want to be that, that decisive because then you open up an outside run lane or an inside run lane, or you just completely whiff on a tackle, which he does Mm -hmm. a lot, but he also makes some crazy big hits. He's got crazy athleticism. And some of that can translate to corner. So I'd love to try him out at corner because he has the athleticism where it could work. There's so many times in press when like he's got the length, he's got the strength, but the footwork isn't always there. Sometimes he gets caught flat footed and then he's just kind of caught playing recovery athleticism and he kind of falls into that a little bit too much. And you can't really rely on that at the next level because everyone's bigger, faster, stronger at the next level. So Alante Taylor would be that guy who in the middle rounds I think would be a great pairing in a double dip fashion because if he didn't pan out a corner, then we may have an answer for the successor to Micah Hyde slash Jordan Poyer. What do you think, Anthony? Is there anyone maybe you have pegged in the middle rounds with a little corner safety flex that uh, you have earmarked as maybe a double dip say, uh, cornerback uh, choice? Taylor is my guy as well, but I I don't see him as a corner at all. He For me, he's just got a lot of – he gets caught flat footed a lot. I thought his decision making and overall feel and kind of awareness and coverage just wasn't necessarily there. His angles to the football, a lot of times on the outside, just it just were inconsistent. And when they were consistent, it was consistently kind of negative in a way. Um, 
but you see his size, you see the physicality, you see the burst. And I think he's best when he's able to keep everything in front of him and he's able to play top down. And when you combine that with his size, his length, his frame, his speed, I think he's more of a natural safety given his body type and frame. I think with the other guys you mentioned, like Cam Taylor Britt, I think he can work at Mm -hmm. corner. Maybe you can play him around and kind of give him a jack of all trades type of feel. Um, Kobe Bryant, I see more as a corner. I don't necessarily see the transition to safety there, given his skill set and what he was able to do on the outside. Um, but Taylor, I think for me, I thought of it back during the senior bowl and then he gets beat in the senior bowl real bad. And Charles Davis starts talking about why he should move to safety. And I was like, Oh my God, like this is like, this just kind of <laughs> like was fate and confirmed what I had in my head. Um, even I think, uh, I think Dane Brugler, who was a really great dude with the draft, I don't think he even has Taylor listed as he's a corner. Got, he's he's he straight safety. safety. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, I think mm-hmm. he has him as a safety. Um, it's just, I think for me, it's like a body type and a play style feel that you see with him. And maybe, you know, who knows? Again, traitsy guy with tools, maybe mm-hmm. you're able to coach him up, so on and so forth. Um, but I think some of his physical traits and skill set that he has, I don't think it transitions to corner at the next level. Mm-hmm. I think he's fit to play safety if he's going to survive in the NFL for a long time. Yeah. A couple people mentioned Damari Mathis from Pitt. That's a really popular one. I want to I want to dive into him a little bit later on when we Boy. get to sort of middle round corners. You like Damari? He's he's Great fun, name. but I think he can Great work. Name. You know, we'll yeah, we'll go. And, I, I and think he can work at corner. He, yeah, he's one of those guys where we get to the third round. If we haven't drafted a corner yet, he's another one of those guys where I think he's got the traits to plug and play. Like, and you could maybe get him as late as the third round. So uh, it should be super interesting. Dave, any maybe like corner safety flex that you got earmarked at any point in this draft? I mean, you guys, you guys know that Taylor has been kind of, the yeah. guy I've had my eye on since before the senior <laughs> bowl. I mean, just a little more on him, former receiver. So it's again, maybe has some room to grow still mm-hmm. um, into kind of learning, you know, some of the football IQ stuff he needs to learn and kind of discipline. He needs to learn on the defensive side of the ball obviously tested extremely well athletically. I yeah. think he was 9.8 something Raz score. Mm-hmm. So he was way up there ran the four, three, six 40 oh. at the combine. So he's got the speed um, tested amazingly, like I said, and um, I, I like him just for the traits, right? So wherever you feel like you can get, put him on the field, knowing that he hasn't been playing the defensive side of the ball for that long Um is appealing to me. And we've talked about, I mean, Anthony made the great comment about the bills, you know, squeezing blood out of stone and getting everything possible out of the secondary that they have, you know, the coaching, the secondary is their calling card. Then maybe Taylor's a guy that they can coach up and really right. use those traits to, to their advantage. Um, mm-hmm. You know, I, I was thinking about this while we were talking about, uh, and it's not too off topic, but, wouldn't it be nice, right? If the bills are their calling card really is to coach up the secondary and they're squeezing blood out of stone to get what they can of these late round guys, what the possibilities would be if they actually went after a high end blue chip prospect paired (laughs) with that ability to coach it up. Now we're talking this. (laughs) Yes. But Taylor, yeah, Taylor's been my guy since before the senior bowl. I, I also kind of agree with Anthony. I like Taylor Britt as well, but I, I think he's, he could play corner. I, I Mm -hmm. I mean, I think he would be a guy that maybe later in his career, you could see him, you Mm -hmm. know, see him transition maybe to safety, but, um, I, uh, yeah, kind of, I, you know, kind of the same. My, the only, the only guy I have that hasn't been mentioned yet is, uh, uh, I think by chance, if he's in the comment section, it's going to kill me because he's been throwing this name out there for mm. three weeks now. Um, and we just hadn't gotten to corners yet. So I hadn't really had a chance to do too much digging. But, uh, Cardell Flott from LSU, six foot one, 175. Mm. He does need to bulk up, at, obviously, at 175, but his top three traits on SAS. Mirror and match athleticism, closing speed, and ball skills and instincts. And they mention how he's got boundary, nickel, and safety flex. So a guy like uh, Cardell Flock could come in and he could be a jack of all trades that like fifth, sixth DB for the Buffalo Bills and maybe long term carve out a role as a safety. Uh, comes from a blue chip program there at LSU. Uh, I think he's one of those guys who's flying under the radar. I think his name will come off the board in the fourth or the fifth round. And some people will be like, who? But a guy like Cordell Flott was he's one of the better slot corners in 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 college football. 
uh, over the past couple of years. So really big fan of Flott, and I think he has some some safety flex as well. I think now that we got Teron Johnson on board, it's it's we don't look so much at at nickel right. cornerback as much. Um, you know, that's why a guy like maybe Marcus Jones, who we're going to get to in a little bit, has been flying under the radar. So um, it'll be super, super interesting. But flying keyword there. Yeah. Seriously. Yeah. <laughs> nice. Let's uh let's get into let's get into the nitty-gritty. Let's get into these first round cornerbacks. I'm gonna pull up my projection board here again. This is just me. Things I'm hearing. I, I follow a ton of different various insiders on social media. I compare multiple draft websites, projection boards, etc. Um, I also have some people I, I always tell people like I don't know anyone, but I know people that know people. And every once in a while, they'll throw me a bone uh, with what they're hearing. So my bona fide first slash first second round guys that I want to start off with. Obviously, I think the bona fide first rounder, Sauce Gardner, Derek Stingley Jr. Those guys are both likely to be top 10, top 15 draft picks. Hmm. I think a, a good number of these players will end up going in the first round, but it, it all depends on whatever flavor of the team's drafting in the first round decide to go. I can see and envision some of these guys slipping into the second round, probably more likely the Wolens and the McCreary's of the world than the Boots and the McDuffie's. But my first second round projection, so guys who can go anywhere between the first and the second round, Trent McDuffie from Washington, Andrew Boot Jr. from Clemson, uh, Kari Elam from Florida, Kyler Gordon from Washington, Tariq Woolen from UTSA, and Roger McCreary from Auburn. So that is my first and first and second round draft boards. Let's start with the big one and let's just start with the dream scenario, a world where the Buffalo Bills trade into the top 10 of the NFL draft. If that were ever to happen, are you team sauce or are you team Stingley? We can make this one quick, but Dave, I'll start with you. You team sauce or you team Stingley? Oh, God. <laughs> oh man, I... he's so torn. Ah. <laughs> uh... I'm going Team Stingley. Get let's get the pair of LSU guys together. Ooh, okay. Um, yeah. I'm just. Right. I mean, Anthony, how about you? What do you think? It's it a works. pipe dream either way, right? Team <laughs> Sauce or Team Stingley? It's real close. Um, I'm going Stingley as well. He's been my corner one um, all off season. I think the athleticism, the intelligence, the functional ability, um, his man coverage ability, mm -hmm. and just I, I, I recognize some of the flaws you see on tape, and then the injury to his foot. That's the biggest thing for me was the inconsistent play as of late, mm -hmm. and the foot injury. But again. If we're still going with this whole motto of mm -hmm. the Bills make you the best version of yourself, well, the best version of Derek Stingley is like a top five corner in the NFL. Right. So, I yeah. mean, granted, it could be there for Sauce as well, um, but I've just been enamored with Stingley and uh, everything that he brings. You're not losing either way, though. Like, if you trade right. up and you get one, like, I, I, you're, if anyone's like, oh, no, they should have did, shut up. Either yeah. one is fantastic. Yeah. You're yeah. fine. <laughs> exactly. Kendall, how about you? Team Sauce, you team Stingley? I'm team sauce. It's probably Ooh. a little bit of bias from it's watching every since he snap this year. And that that's probably where it starts and ends just the bias. But I mean, they're neck and neck, man. Like what's really going to separate them. So I'm going with my mm. bias to separate them. There, there's also really has a cooler name. So I'm going with, I'm yeah. going with Stingley based 100% off of that video on Twitter of him covering Jamar chase in practice. Yeah. And that I'm, helped 100%. a lot of people 100%. that helped win over a lot of people. Uh, <laughs> Spin comes in and says, in what world does Booth or McDuffie go in the second round? I would say that we, we all fall into a trap of, we think just because a simulator says something it's true, but I mean, Peter Schrager, who's pretty connected on NFL network just came out today and he says, he thinks that the top five receivers in this draft are all going to go before pick 20. Like people are going to drop. I, I've talked to some people who don't think Devonte Wyatt's going to be a first round pick. I've talked to some people who say that a good number of NFL teams have a second round grade on Andrew Booth Jr. That doesn't mean that the other half of the teams don't have a first round grade on Andrew Booth Jr. But what happens if that other team gets another guy that they want? Uh, so that's why I put the first second round earmark on them. I think that they, I can confidently say, I think they will go before pick 62 or pick 64, but I'm not willing to guarantee you sit here and guarantee you that Andrew Booth or Trent McDuffie is going to be a first round pick. Do I think that they both ultimately go in the first round? Hell yeah, I do. That's why they're the first two on my list of the first and the second round first slash second round, but I'm not willing to earmark that either of them for the first round, because I think a lot of that is dictated on where teams decide to go, how the board falls, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm just not hundred percent willing to, uh, to make that, um, to make that distinction of them as a bona fide first rounder, like I would a Stingley or a sauce. Ned Ryerson comes in with a super chat. I always appreciate you, Ned. He says, how big of a drop off 
do you guys think there is after the four top rated cornerbacks? I'm assuming what he means here is Sauce, Stingley, Booth, and McDuffie. Those are, I think most people would consider the top four corners in this draft. How big is the drop off after these four? Um, I'll, I'll reverse it up here. Kendall, what do you think? How big is the drop off after these four? I mean, my next two are McCreary and Gordon, and I don't, I don't think there's a massive drop off, mm -hmm. albeit there is a drop off. But I think the biggest drop off there is McCreary's inch and a half shorter arms, and that's where it starts and ends. Like the tape is up there. Honestly, when I was watching the tape, I, I had them graded out almost equally, McDuffie and McCreary. But the reason I have McCreary lower than McDuffie is literally the arm length. That's the only reason that dropped him lower than McDuffie for me, mm -hmm. because I think the tape is equal if not better and then with gordon there are some concerns in terms of i guess i guess i'll put it as football intelligence at the position it almost feels like he's new to the position but i love everything that he does there and the potential that he has to grow within the cornerback position i don't think there's a drop off per se and i think a lot of people are high on Kyer elam despite his I guess, fall back to earth in 2021. But mm -hmm. I, I still think he's a good player. I don't think it's like you're missing out on a lot if you're taking McCreary, Gordon, or Elam at 25 versus the, those top four guys. Are they as good as those top four? Maybe not. But it's not like it's a crazy drop-off that should scare mm -hmm. you from not taking one of them at 25 if the board suggests so. Mm -hmm. Anthony, how about you? Like, What's your drop-off after those four? Um, like anyone you still feel comfortable taking with the 25th pick outside of those four. I'm fine taking sauce Stingley McDuffie booth Gordon or McCreary at 25. Mm -hmm. And honestly, I didn't love the Kyir Elam tape, um, but I understand his traits and his skill set and his size and the speed and all that kind of stuff. So yeah. I understand the people that want to make a case for him at 25. Um, I don't like it, but I'm okay with it. Yeah. I think the for the drop off, I think after the top four, there's a the big drop off for me isn't the next batch of guys, the McCreary's, the Gordons, the Elams. I think the bigger mm -hmm. drop is from those first four guys to then what you start to get in like the round more closer towards like the end of round two or the early round three guys, yeah. the Cam Taylor Brits, the Marcus Jones, the Kobe Bryant's, the Emerson's, depending on yeah. how you have your board ranked. I think once you start to get after those top seven, top eight corners, now you're starting to look more into scheme fit and skill set area. Now you're drafting yeah. guys based on, you know, team A might have this corner as their eighth guy, but team B mm -hmm. might have him as their 15th guy because he doesn't have the frame or the skill set type of thing. I think you start to get more mix and match, mix and matchy. And that's where it gets a little dangerous for me because then you have to, you have teams grabbing guys based on mm -hmm. what they can do individually because holistically they don't have it there. Like those top four. And even really for me, the top seven kind of eight guys have. Yeah. Uh, you guys both mentioned, uh, Kyrie Elam here. Both mentioned that you just don't feel the most comfortable with him. Yeah. Six foot two, 191 pounds, which is, I think, a frame that a lot of people are sort of yeah. interested in. Uh, SIS has his top three traits as physical, tracks mm. the ball well, and he understands route concepts. So those are three things that I think could intrigue the Buffalo Bills. But his cons, tight hips, not the most enthusiastic run defender, mm. not the greatest tape in 2021. So if the Buffalo, if we, if we have to pick number 25 and the Buffalo Bills pull the trigger on Kyrie Elam, it's the physic, it's the physicality, it's the tracking the ball well, it's mm -hmm. the understanding of the route concepts. I've heard from a couple of people that he's interviewed really well, so that might help his draft stock a little bit. Um, the guy who I talked to that said he didn't think that Andrew Booth had as many first round grades as some people think also mm -hmm. said that of all the second round grades, Elam was the most likely to be taken in the first round because he interviewed so well. So again, a guy like Elam, if he's the pick at 25, that's sort of that they're, they're, they're taking the traits and they're betting on the coaching. I think when you go with a guy like high ear Elam, Dave, how about you? Like after the big four, where's sort of your head at in this cornerback class? If we were to take one at pick number 25. Yeah, I'll just say for the record, McDuffie is my CB3. I have him over Booth mm -hmm. um, right now. Um, but I will say, I like, I do like Elam. The thing that concerns me about him, obviously, is he's dropped off each year since 2019, right? He, You go back and look at his grading and his snap counts, and 
in 2019, he was top 20 rated corner per PFF. Then he dropped down to, um, you know, he dropped down to 58th in 2020 and then went all the way down to 600 in the 600s in 2021. But then you're like, well, does that really make sense? Cause then you look at it and he's, and he still only allowed 19 catches for 191 yards on the entire season. So like there's something in there and maybe the tape guys would know better than me. Like what's the real story going on there with Kyrie Elam. I would say from a physical mm -hmm. stature and like traits perspective, I, I like him in that mix, right. With Gordon yeah. And, and with McCreary, um, I think those three to me are the next three. Right. And then I think there's a drop off after mm. that. Like Anthony said, like, I think after that, then you start getting down to, you know, you getting, you're getting down now into like, you know, the Martin Emerson's or whoever may come after that for you. But so for me, I kind of look at it as like a top seven almost with like a yep. little bit of a line of demarcation, almost like the receivers in a way, right. You kind of have those top six or seven receivers and you kind of maybe put dots in sort of on the, on the other side of the line of demarcation. Maybe you put Christian Watson on the other side, but to me it's similar. And that's why I think you're right, Steve, like someone's going to fall, right. If the, if the mm -hmm. receivers become the hot commodity in the first round, then mathematically somebody's going to fall. Um, and we know we've talked about other positions like defensive line and others that are mm -hmm. really kind of shallow at the top end where mm -hmm. there's really like maybe two or three top guys. And you could see teams paying a premium for those guys. And then maybe this fourth, fifth, sixth corner becomes available at 25 and, and the bills mm -hmm. feel comfortable staying put and taking them, which would, would, would be fine with me. Honestly, yeah. it would be fine. All right, so let's say that that Peter Schrager sort of prediction that you talked about on Good Morning Football this morning comes true. And there are five wide receivers off the board in the first 20, 22 picks. And like some cornerbacks have dropped and the Buffalo Bills get to pick number 25 and Trent McDuffie and Andrew Booth Jr. are on the board. Let's say we get to a scenario where those two guys are on the board. Kendall and Anthony, I'm going to pit you two against each other because I like to have fun. Hmm. One, one of you guys, show of hands, whoever's hand goes up quickest, I'm going to make one of you pick Trent McDuffie and one of you pick Andrew Booth and sell these guys as to why you would pick one over the other. Who wants Booth? I know Kendall does. Yeah, yeah I, don't, I didn't Did think we McDuffie? had to do that. Yeah, right. I, I knew it was going to be easy <laughs> okay. once you said the two so, players. <laughs> so Kendall, sell sell Andrew Booth as as pick number twenty five, even if Trent McDuffie's on the board. All right, so Andrew Booth, you're screaming scream versatility. He, he is everything you want in terms of can play man, can play zone. He played a ton of complicated zone stuff at Clemson, has a really good understanding of how to leverage spacing in zone and make sure he's passing off and communicating to the next guy, but also keeping his discipline to make sure if someone's coming into his deep zone, he's there for it. And then he's got the athleticism where he can carry a dude up the field. He rarely gets stacked vertically. He's got plenty of speed, plenty of short area quickness where he's going to be able to mirror match and stay in phase and in the hip pocket of wide receivers with ease. And with coaching, I think it's only going to get better. Obviously, the good coaching that we talked about in Buffalo. The only downside, I'm telling you, the only downside is Booth is how aggressive he is in the run game. And that's a blessing mm -hmm. and a curse with him because sometimes he will come downhill and make a crazy play. Other times he'll come downhill and just take a terrible angle mm. and miss a tackle. That being said, we saw that with Matt Milano and Teron Johnson. That got coached out of them once they spent more time in the system. They had similar similar cons. They were kind of too aggressive in that regard. They dialed it back. They started to play within themselves, but it's still a part of their game. And I think the Bills could do the same thing with Booth. So I love the scheme versatility that he provides and his aggressiveness. All right, Anthony, how about you? If both are on the board, why are you taking McDuffie over Andrew Booth Jr.? I'm taking McDuffie because of the consistency that he gives you at the position from a professional way that he plays the cornerback position. His athleticism, his physical traits are, are nice, but the way he leverages space, his ability to pattern match, his ability to carry his man upfield and pass off and drop and read based on what routes are coming his way and based on what the quarterback is doing, his 
mental processing is so there. He's controlled. He's technically sound. He has the fundamentals. And then his scheme versatility, he can function in zone in the short areas of the field. He can function in zone in the vertical areas of the field. He can function in man coverage going horizontally across the field. And when he comes up, his click and close ability, when he comes up and makes a tackle, it's impressive because it's impactful. He detonates on contact and he rarely has those fly out of control misses that you see from someone like an Andrew Booth. I think Booth has more overall athleticism that you're trying to tap into. And to Kendall's point, you're just trying to kind of, he's that impressive horse that you're trying to rein in a little bit. And you're just trying to like, whoa, like calm down. And then he'll take off and really go. I think Trent McDuffie is just, he's got a high ceiling, but he also presents you a high floor because of the way he approaches the game, the way he plays it. And just again, a lot of his physical tools, the hip fluidity, the footwork, how smooth he is in his back pedal, his, his, his hand usage and how he uses that to leverage the receivers at different points in the route stem and in different coverages and schemes. And you put it all together. And I think there's a, you know, you could legitimately make a case that he might even be the second best corner in this class for some people. And mm -hmm. I, I, he, but again, that's also a fun thing. Like if you've got four guys who are in that conversation, just one of them need to fall to the bills. <laughs> <laughs> um, L El Shar made a great comment earlier and it's 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 long gone by now, but I, I wrote it down on my little a little notepad here, a little old school, uh, because I wanted to to round back to it. She said, when the Buffalo Bills are looking to draft a cornerback at pick number 25, do you go traits or do you go instincts? And I think that Tariq Woolen is a great uh, a great thing to uh to bring up here when we talk about that because I have here in my notes Tariq Woolen. The Spencer Brown of cornerbacks, uh, where he is very much like sort of that ball of clay type of thing where the Buffalo Bills look for that athletic freak and they trust their coaching and they trust their development that they can turn that player into a, you know, elite or higher end NFL player, sort of like what they did with the likes of of Josh Allen. So my question to you guys is, do you have that belief in Tariq Woolen? Like, is he worth pick number 25 to you? Is it pick number 57? Where do you go with, uh, where do you go with, or what are your thoughts on Tariq Woolen? Dave, I'm going to start with you. What do you think about Tariq Woolen? I like him, but, and I mean. I should say, where's I your hate, comfort with him? <laughs> I, I hate, I hate to read too much into history, but it's like, this seems like the one position where the bills don't go that direction ever. Mm -hmm. Right. It was the same thing. I mean, don't get me wrong, like Trey White's fantastic, but like he was never the guy that was like the uber athletic, like I'm like the 10.0, rat. like he, that wasn't him, right? <laughs> and he's really been the only corner that they've ever invested early draft capital in throughout this regime, right? So they've they've gone for other guys with traits like Spencer Brown, like Gregory Rousseau, right? They've gone for guys like that, but they've never done it with corners. So I'm not saying I'm uncomfortable with Tariq Woolen. I'm just kind of projecting that I would not think the Bills would go that route with that position just based on history. Now, history can change, and we shouldn't necessarily always let history dictate what happens in the future, but I I would be surprised if the Bills spent early capital on a traitsy guy at that position. Not at other positions, but at that position, I would be. Mm. Oh, oh, Judge, you're Judge. muted. Here, I'm mute. Oh, pull the Greg. Oh, Anna, oh, Anna now turned now my camera off. Look at that. <laughs> this is what I get for commenting in the comments section. Uh, but uh, Anthony, where's your comfort level lie with Tariq Wollin? Is he a first round guy to you with those traits? Do you feel better in the second round or do you just not even like him at all? Like, what are your thoughts on Tariq Wollin? I mean, his traits are super impressive. Anytime you're a corner and you run a sub four, three, 40, like that's going to start to open people's eyes. Um, I understand the case for him a as a whole. I I'm not holistically comfortable with him at 25. Um, I, I think for a lot of it for me, I think we talk about traits and I think the conversation with traits, a lot of times it gets pointed to the physical. So it's like, oh, how fast can they run or how strong are they and things like that. I think the mental piece of it is a big traits piece that gets overlooked. And I question his eye discipline um, and his mental processing right now in terms of reading routes and how he recovers. A lot of what I've seen of him, you know, even for for being such a fast guy, he gets beat deep 
a decent amount of the time. Mm-hmm. And now you could play devil's advocate and be like, well, he takes chances because he knows he's the fastest dude on the field and he knows he can recover. But there's throws that don't get made against him in coverage on tape that in the NFL gets made. NFL quarterbacks make mm-hmm. those throws or NFL receivers make those catches. But again, the traits are very impressive. I'd be comfortable with him in the third round. I mean, you could do a lot worse than taking a long, fast corner <laughs> Uh, Mm -hmm. in, in the third (laughs) round, you know, there's, there's a lot of worse things to do there. Um, so I'd be comfortable with him in the third round, but then again, at that same token, right. What I think you have to do that. Then I think you have to go with, with the Kendall model there, or you might even have to dip more into free agency, because I feel like if you take Tariq Woolen, right, if he's your, the, the first corner you take off the board for the Buffalo bills, the big, the ceiling is what the Mm. sexy thing is. Right. But the question for me is what's the floor. Like, what does he offer you in 2022, 2023, Mm -hmm. 2024? And I guess, you know, if you can make that case, the further you go down, ideally, he's continuing to trend upward. But what does 2022 look like? Is he able to beat out Dane Jackson? Does he have the head for the position that we know the Buffalo Bills Mm -hmm. covet? Like, Levi Wallace was an unathletic guy. He wasn't strong. He wasn't Mm -hmm. thick. He wasn't physical. But he was mentally savvy. He was that guy that was the proverbial always in the right place at the right time. Teammates knew where he was going to be. And that's a huge point in this defense. Kendall and I talked about it last week, right? The Bills defense is vanilla and not to say that negatively, but they only run a certain amount of coverages and offenses know what's going to happen. The reason the Bills are so good defensively is because their communication and execution of those few coverages and concepts is always on point. And the only way that can happen is if you know where he's going to be and where he's going to be, and they know where you're going to be, and you're all reading the same thing at the same time, and you have the same level of communication and understanding to be in that position. And the fastest and strongest guys that doesn't matter if you can't get the mental piece done in the technique side of things. So I mm-hmm. love the traits from a physical standpoint, but I question what that floor is and what the NFL readiness mm-hmm. is given the competition he faced and some of the things I saw on tape, but I love the physical tools. I want to, I want to transition now to, we still got two more guys. We got to talk about here in the, in the first second round slash debate here, Kyler Gordon and Roger McCreary. I want to touch on Kyler Gordon a little bit here because a lot of people tell me whenever I take him at 25, like, oh, you reached. But I, I I don't think he's a reach. I see a lot of not just like, not like, you know, draft site mocks. I see a lot of like insider mocks, guys like Peter Schrager, et cetera, guys like Tony Pauline, guys who legitimately make their mocks after having conversation with scouts and GMs and front office people across the league. They all typically have Kyler Gordon going in the back half of the first round. And I look at a guy like Kyler Gordon and I think he fits exactly what the Buffalo Bills sort of might be looking for in a cornerback number two. Most people are going to be like, but he doesn't run a fast 40. Like I understand he doesn't run a fast 40, but how many people sit there and run track speed all the time? The guy is an athletic freak. If you go, he was on Bruce Feldman's freak list. This is a guy who is just uber flexible. Um, you know, he, he, he's got a history background in, in dance and uh, martial arts and all these different things. Like the guy is just super flexible and super athletic. He's got measurables that are literally almost like to a T comparable. Daniel Jeremiah put the testing numbers side by side comparable to a guy like Marcus Peters, who's been a very good cornerback in the national football league when healthy. And what I like about Kyler Gordon is nickel cornerback, boundary cornerback flex. So if you're the Buffalo bills, you might start week one, maybe Trey White's healthy, and it's and it's Trey White on one side, Kyler Gordon on the other, Teron in the slot. But you know, a guy like Trey or a, a, you know, a guy like Teron Johnson gets injured. Well, Kyler Gordon can move into the nickel instead of Saran Neal, and you yeah. could put Dane Jackson on the boundary. So you have that flexibility, and you can move a guy like Kyler Gordon around a little bit, and he gives you a little bit more uh, flexibility. Closing speed, coverage instincts, reactive Mm -hmm. athleticism. Those are all things. Those are all traits that I see in every single Kyler Gordon scouting report. Um, So to me, Kyler Gordon is one of my favorite picks. My, I call him my, my, my safety pick, right? (laughs) He's my safety pick. My, my, uh, you know, you can't find a date to the dance. I can't find the date to the dance. Let's go (laughs) together. He is my safety. (laughs) He is my safety pick of this year's draft. At pick number 25. Kendall, I'm going to start with you. What are your thoughts on Kyler Gordon? Well, when I'm doing mock drafts, I like literally have to have someone tell me to do something different or like give myself a rule because I find myself drafting Kyler Gordon at 25 every single time. (laughs) It's a problem. So 
that's the biggest like i'm so comfortable with it but like comfortable with it to a point that i feel like it's just not going to happen in real life oh, now okay. I, I i really love him as a player super versatile like you were saying and, and as i alluded to earlier i even think he could play safety if he doesn't happen to work out at corner but i think he'll work out mm -hmm. yeah that hit fluidity and reactive athleticism piece you see it like he mm -hmm. can mirror wide receivers in his sleep he's really good at it when he loses at the at the line of scrimmage and press he has the uh the recovery athleticism athleticism to make himself right after he made himself wrong which is a great thing you mm -hmm. want to see and that closing ability to play through the catch point and break up passes show up that show mm -hmm. that ball skills that all of that together tells me he's someone that hasn't even broken into his full potential. He shows a lot of it, but I think there's still, there's still something to be tapped into with him. And I think there's like a mental component for him where it's kind of similar to the booth thing. He's very, very aggressive in the run game and he's mm. really good at it, but mm. there's kind of an over aggression there. And I think sometimes you see that a little bit in coverage, not nearly as much as it is in the run game, but you see it a little, a little bit in coverage where he gets a little over aggressive and I think that's a simple thing that can be coached out of him, especially in the right system like Buffalo, where you have to play disciplined football. Like Ant was saying, you got to know, you got to have trust in your teammates mm -hmm. to know exactly where they're going to be at all times. And I have no problems with him being coachable and getting to that point, because I think he's shown that he's grown through the years at Washington. I have tons of confidence in him and I would be perfectly more than content with him at 25. Yeah. And I'll, I'll tell you what, the one thing from, you know, I don't have it in my notes here, but another thing that I've seen a ton of different scouting reports with Kyler Gordon too, that could pique the interest of the Buffalo Bills is just really good in the red zone, like a really good corner in the red zone, uh, shutting down guys near uh, the end zone. So that is something I think that's also a positive for Kyler Gordon. Uh, Anthony, to you, I want to finish this out with Roger McCreary here. You Ooh. said you would feel comfortable <laughs> taking Roger McCreary at pick number 25. Uh, my wife thinks it's weird that whenever you talk about Roger McCreary and his hip fluidity, I get a little excited. She's like, why do you want to listen to this before we go to bed? Every I'm like, listen, okay. listen to Anthony talk about before Roger McCreary we... and his, yeah. uh, his hip fluidity. Let me put on some tape for you. Hold on. Come sit, go to bed. <laughs> SIS has his strengths as press coverage, versatility, and toughness, but his weakness is zone coverage, awareness, off man ability, and inconsistency. So if you're looking this, if you're looking at this from this at a Buffalo Bills type of perspective, looking at the strengths, looking at the weaknesses, a guy like McCreary might not exactly line up with what you would expect the Buffalo Bills to do at cornerback. Why would you feel comfortable taking him at pick number 25? I love him as a player. Like, I mean, the dude shut down the SEC. Uh, he's so good at keeping guys to the boundary. I love McCreary, but what, what would make you feel comfortable taking him if you're the Buffalo Bills in the Buffalo Bills system? how technically sound he is and how he's able to maintain that technique against a variety of receivers. I'll, I'll just keep it to, you know, th three guys that I know a lot of the viewers are familiar with um, mm -hmm. watching him cover Johan Dotson against Penn state and literally just one-on-one -on -one lock him down in a variety of ways over and over watching him run stride for stride on deep overs and vertical routes against Alabama covering Jamison Williams watching him cover John Mechie and shut him down a variety of routes over and over. Mm -hmm. And then I know you're going to get somebody that's going to come in and be like, yeah, but <laughs> Mechie burned him for that, that touchdown in overtime. So that means McCreary sucks. Stop it. His technicality, his hand technique, his hips, his footwork, his ability to maintain leverage in a variety of ways, his speed turn, the snap that he possesses with that, right? His, his press man, ability and man coverage in general is very, very real again against a variety of wide receiver body types and skill sets. And then for the zone piece, I've got two thoughts for that one. I've seen him not to the sample size that I'd like, but mm. I've seen him enough in zone coverage to get a feel that he understands what he needs to do. He understands spacing and he understands leverage. And I think given what he's done with everything else, you start to coach him up and I think he'll function right within that. But the man coverage piece I think is important because I've continued to say it on Twitter, you know, judge, I know you've retweeted it several times that I've said it at some point, all zone coverage becomes man coverage at every zone, right? But especially mm -hmm. the bills type of zone coverage, which is a pattern match zone coverage, which essentially means 
I think a lot of people just think zone and they just think, okay, cool. Like the guys drop and they go to their zone. The bills don't really play spot drop zone like that. They play pattern match zone, which means based on the route distribution from the wide receivers, you are going to see man coverage principles from the corners, the linebackers, the safeties. That's also part of the reason why a lot of linebackers can't do what Tremaine Edmonds does. That's a conversation for another time. (laughs) Roger McCreary's man coverage ability would fit in this defense also combined with the fact judge, this is something you've said, Kendall, I know you've said it. We've talked about it on the show. The bills do a lot of games and schemes when it comes to three by one sets. And one of the things they like to do is play man coverage on the single receiver side and having somebody who can man up a variety of receivers and skill sets and body types in those one-on-one scenarios, let alone in the pattern match scenarios, I think is something that could really work for you. Now, when you add in, the size and the arm length and all those things, I think it's warranted. I also think that if Roger McCreary had longer arms, he would be a hands down top three corner in mm-hmm. this class. And I don't yep. think there would be any doubt about it when you combine the tape and his technicality. Also, he's physical in the run game. Like he comes up and sticks dudes. Um, I just think he's a really sound player. And I think he plays faster than his 40 time indicates. And again, we're talking about just adding good football players. You can do a lot worse than a mm-hmm. technically sound player going to a team known for getting the best out of those kind of guys. Yeah, it's crazy. I mean, Roger McCreary was all season long in college football. If you go to any web, any draft web, website, listen to any draft podcast, he was up there with Trent McDuffie like tied for CB3. All of a sudden, he measures, has short arms. He's now he's CB6. Like, come on. I mean, it's <laughs> scary like that. Who, I forgot who put out that tweet, like the list of short oh, arm yeah. corners having success. Mm. It's not good. Yeah, like it's, but McDuffie's it's, in the same boat. Correct. I mean, he is in the same boat. And yeah. but people seem to all of a sudden have like overlooked that. And I love the conversations on Twitter where it's like, well, I'm taking McDuffie over McCreary because McCreary's got short arms. And I'm like, so does McDuffie. <laughs> like, what are we doing? Um, yeah, and it's I mean, on the Richard Sherman podcast, uh highly suggest listening to it. A couple of things that I took away from it. One of them was Roger McCreary li- without hesitation. Who do you model your game after? Who's somebody that you watch? First, first answer. Not even hesitating. Trey White. You mentioned Trey White. So and you see that when you watch him play mm-hmm. too. He moves in a very similar way to Trey. And and the second thing he mentioned was where do you think you're going to be drafted? He mentioned that his agent told him to expect late first, early second. So mm-hmm. that's what his agent is telling. So even his agent Stars is sort of telling. Lining. Yeah. So even his agent is telling him like you're not going to be one of those top two, top three guys. You're probably going to be cornerback four, five, six off the board. So that is legit. He, like he is legitimately dropping, but he was in a higher conversation and the length of his arms is, is, is what drops him. So uh, let's transition now to uh, back to the draft board. And I want to talk about guys who could make their way, you know, could be drafted in the second round, could slip into the third round. I got a list of five guys here that I think are bona fide second slash third rounders. Now there's always a chance that maybe one of these guys, two of these guys slips into the fourth round and some of these fourth uh, round guys slip into the third round. Uh, the guys at the top of my fourth round list, Josh Williams from Fayetteville State, Zion McCollum from Sam Houston State, two traitsy small schoolers who could get drafted really high because sometimes it's projection over college projection. And I think Kobe Bryant and Marcus Jones are two guys who could be drafted a lot earlier as well. And Kendall, I was mentioning to you before the show started, I think a guy like Jalen Armour Davis could go late day two and mm-hmm. it would not shock me. I would not blink one bit. Um, a fast riser believe it or not, coming from Alabama, but he hasn't played a lot of games. Uh, But my second and third rounders that I have, Mario Goodrich from Clemson, Lante Taylor from Tennessee, who we mentioned and we've talked about already. Some people have him strictly as a safety on their boards. Damari Mathis from Pittsburgh, great name. Cam Taylor Britt, uh, seems like one of Bill's Mafia's favorites this year. Maybe the new... um, Maybe the new... uh, What was his name? Bryce Hall? Bryce Hall? Bryce Hall. The new Bryce Mm -hmm. Hall. Virginia. Uh, And then the new favorite which has always been one of my favorites, but he has visited with the Buffalo Bills. That is Martin Emerson, a really good zone corner out of Mississippi State. Dave, looking at that second, third round sort of hodgepodge of corners, like who's your dude there? Who are you standing for in that second, third round range? Uh, I'm not as high on Emerson as a lot of people. I I just, I'm not, I'm not. (gasps) Yeah, sorry. (laughs) Sorry, I'm just not. Um... (laughs) I know Kendall likes him too, but it's just like yeah. dropping. I'm dropping the bomb on you guys. I like Taylor Britt um, out of that group. I know we talked about a bunch of the um, bunch of the other guys already, um, but Taylor Britt. I mean, the reason 
is just seems like he's kind of like maybe a I didn't even want to call him a poor man's McDuffie because it's kind of like a an unfair comparison because mm -hmm. He just seems very sound to me. And like the mm -hmm. clips that Anthony and Kendall have been putting out on on Taylor Britt because Bill's Mafia has been enamored by him <sighs> for some time now have really kind of opened my eyes to the fundamentals he brings and sort of the the floor, I guess, you were get, would get out of a guy that when you're picking in the third round, getting a high floor seems like a pretty nice proposition to me. And then... There is that fallback option, I suppose. If he doesn't sort of pan out, you do have that potential move to bring him over to safety. But it seems to me like out of those guys that he has a pretty solid floor. And I mean, look, he's not playing at he he's not coming from right like at least now back in like the nineties, mm -hmm. Nebraska sure was like a powerhouse, <laughs> but like they're not a powerhouse anymore, right? Right. So right. for him to be doing that in a conference, obviously, where the, the, the bullets are flying fast and often, right? I feel like it, it's a nice it's a nice spot for him, and it's a very mm -hmm. popular spot to see him get mocked as in the third round. And if the Bills do pass, you know, on a corner in the first and second round, I kind of set my, my line there being day one or two, he'd probably be the guy I'd go to bat for in the third round. However, there is a guy that I'd probably go to bat for in the third round that you have in the fourth, fifth, but uh, we'll save Ooh, that. for, for the You can drop the name now drop if it, you would drop like. It. like drop it. Monteric. I mean, Ooh, I'd pick him. In the third. boy. Yeah. I mean, for the same reasons that you talked about, Kendall talked about Andrew Booth mm -hmm. being scheme versatile. Monteric is, yeah. is that as well. Just yeah. doesn't have the amazing athletic numbers popping off the tape, but he ran yeah. what he needed to ran run mm -hmm. at the combine right mm -hmm. he was in the he was in the low four fives which i think was good for him because that was going to be the question was like how fast was he going to show up there but if you watch him and you watch the games and you guys watch the tape know better than me but just watching the games the arkansas games that i did it seemed like he was in the right position more often than not mm -hmm. right and so i'm willing to take a swing on monteric in the third round if it came down to it late third round that's where we, we got are, so. A bunch of you on the comment section saying, like, obviously, Cam Taylor Britt is 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 Bill's mafia darling. Um, you know, he's been a Bill's mafia darling since early on in the process. Whether it was mm -hmm. uh, you you talking about him, Aaron Quinn talking about him, Aaron talking about him, Joe Marino talking about him, a lot of people within the sort of the Bill's mafia community have been all in on Cam Taylor Britt for for a very long time now, and it sort of made me like question like. Is this like looking like, you know, the rose colored glasses, right? Are we looking through the Bills Mafia colored glasses or is this guy a bona fide? <laughs> is this guy a bona fide second, third rounder league wide? And so I, you know, I did my due diligence. I looked around the various different sites. I DM some people who typically have insider information that I trust. Uh, and then I built a relationship and they've told me he's legit top 75 top 80 player in this SIS draft. has him as their number six yeah. overall corner. They, they, so. they, they tell me he's a top 75 player in this draft. So I wouldn't be surprised if Cam Taylor breaking off the board, maybe in the second round, like there, I think there's a legit possibility that that could happen. So that Cam Taylor he ran well stuff, too. Yeah. I mean, to yeah, me, isn't, well isn't, that, uh, isn't that, isn't that sort of bills mafia colored glasses? I think he's a legit bona fide prospect uh, league wide. Our guy, Bruce exclusive, uh, Bruce Nolan on Twitter. he, uh, he did an interesting thing today. He did a choose your fighter between Jihad Donson and Sky Moore. Um, I want to do a little choose your fighter here between Anthony and Kendall. I just want to keep pitting you guys against each other. I like it. Um, choose I your already fighter. know how this is going to go, so go ahead. Choose your fighter between these two players. And again, you might both just prefer this player over the other because of the way you've talked about one of them is mostly a safety at this point. Alante Taylor versus Cam Taylor Britt. Choose your fighter. Oh, Anthony, I'll start Ooh, with you. This could be interesting. As a, as yeah. a corner? Take your pick, a, Anthony. Pick who you want to talk about. I'll, okay, I'll take Cam Taylor Britt. Um, okay, I think his. But again, for me, like if we're, I, I, I wouldn't compare them in the same round because I think Alani Taylor is going to have to go to safety. Um, mm -hmm. Much in the way that Malcolm Jenkins went to safety. No, I'm not saying that Alani Taylor is going to be Malcolm Jenkins, <laughs> but I <laughs> see the type of movement for him. How dare um, you, Anthony? That's going to go viral. <laughs> um, you know what? You're right. I'm sorry. Thank you for having me. Goodbye. Um, <laughs> I think when you're looking at Britt, the, the athleticism and the speed and the strength comes out you know he's just a hair over 510 he's about 200 pounds like he looks thick and he is like he he detonates on impact in a variety of ways you see that explosion and you see a variety of 
coverage types for him. He's got ball skills. He's able to, you know, he's, he's good on pass breakups, downfield, upfield, uh, coming top down, playing with his back to receivers. But I think for, for me, some of the hesitation, and this is where I start to see like that, that level of separation between those first couple corners after the top six or seven. And then you start to get into mm-hmm. the Cam Taylor Brits of the world. You do see the inconsistency when it comes to the pattern recognition and the route recognition. The first, the first game that I watched for Cam Taylor Britt was against Oklahoma, and it was terrible. I hated him. He mm-hmm. Oklahoma ran the same concept, the same stick concept over and over, just at different levels, and he kept not reading it. It was the same play over and over, and he kept getting beat over and over. And there was a lack of route recognition combined with being too over aggressive and all these things. And then I watched three more games, and he was a completely different player. Still had some of those inconsistencies and some of those flaws and technical pieces that you need to clean up, but you saw more of the functional athleticism play a role regularly in terms of what he was able to do. Now he's gonna he's gonna have to clean up that technique because as fast as he is, he's not gonna be able to recover regularly against NFL receivers and NFL quarterbacks like he did at Nebraska, getting caught peeking into the backfield, being too aggressive in trying to come up and break things up and then getting beat over the top and then backtracking, recovering at the catch point and disrupting things. I don't think that type of thing is going to happen with regularity. Um he's gonna have to get more consistent with his jam technique um when he's up in press, whether in man or in zone um but he you see it he's fluid he's athletic he's strong he's explosive he's got burst again he's in that realm of i think he's in that mold of like a kyler gordon someone who's a jack Mm -hmm. of all who can be a jack of all trades you can hone him in on one spot or you can use him as kind of this monster man all over the field because of his athleticism and skill set and traits that he possesses Kendall, choose your fighter. Lante Taylor, Cam Taylor, Britt, where are you going here? I got to go with Lante Taylor at this point. Um, <laughs> all right, so with Lante Taylor, I, I'm in the boat where I really do want for Buffalo. I think it makes the most sense. I want to try him at cornerback because of all the traits. Till you talked about it earlier. Like It's really intriguing. Size, length, speed. He's got the combination where it's like, he could work at cornerback, and with the right coaching, he could be really good at cornerback. But where he is right now, there are a lot of gaps to fill in. And that's the biggest concern. Like, he's good in press, but he's not as good as he should be in press Mm -hmm. coverage because he's long. He's big. He should be good at jam, like getting his hand up in the wide receiver's chest plate and making it hard for them to get off the line of scrimmage. Mm -hmm. He's not using that length enough. He's depending on his foot quickness to kind of mirror match people in press where that's not necessarily a deficiency for him. He's plenty athletic but he's not using one of his greatest strengths. So you kind of question, why are you relying so much on your athleticism when you don't even have to? And it then goes to people are going to get bigger, better, faster, stronger at the next level. You can't just rely at that at the next level. You got to use what is unique to you and that's your length and strength. So he's got to use that. And if he's not using it now, it's going to take a little bit longer for that floor to kick in once it gets coached up at the next level. So I think it's very intriguing. Like he does have recovery athleticism when he gets flat footed to go ahead, go on the backside of that play and make a play on it because he has the speed to recover. But once again, bigger, better, faster, stronger. You can't just rely on that at the next level. So I like the bag of tools that he has in terms of athletic Mm -hmm. traits. Um, I did see a little bit of zone knowledge in terms of discipline and how he would sit in his spot and leverage space uh, against two routes coming into his area. So that was encouraging to at least see that to an extent, but it wasn't enough to tell me, yeah, this dude's a baller corner from day one. There, there (laughs) is, there's definitely some, there is some concern when it comes to his floor Mm -hmm. right away at the position, but I will not argue that he doesn't have a high ceiling at the corner position, because I think he has all the athleticism to tap into it. The question is, will he? Mm-hmm. And I'm more confident that he will tap into it at the safety position than the corner position. But I do want to take a swing at that, especially with the coaching staff we have in Buffalo. There's another player that I want to talk to a little bit about. And, you know, the Buffalo Bills like to draft players from the ACC. You know, we have brought in Andrew Booth Jr. for a top 30 visit. This other guy seems to go under the radar a little bit and doesn't get much love from from Bill's Mafia. Mario Goodrich from from Clemson. I know you guys talked about him on on one of the early film rooms. Yeah. 
where are, are you comfortable with Mario Goodrich? Where would you take him? I think Kendall, you might have said he's not, it's not like he's Levi Wallace, but he's Levi Wallace type of just like vanilla. Like I didn't he's mean to do it. It was on the film room. <laughs> I was explaining him. Yeah. And then it was either you or Eric Anthony. One of you was like, so Levi Wallace. And I was like, oh God, I, <laughs> I just, I just ex explained Levi Wallace. I didn't even mean to. So would that turn the bills away, away from a guy like Mario Goodrich or would that turn them on to a guy like Mario Goodrich? Are they looking to go away from what Levi provided and add a little bit more ceiling or are they content with just replacing straight up replacing Levi? What do you guys think? And I kind of want to defer to you on this one. <laughs> Look, I'll just say this. The track record shows they're they're not trying to diverge from what they've done. <laughs> I mean, I mean, Kevin look Johnson. at like. I mean, but Kevin Johnson was maybe just like a more Stop a, slightly more athletic, yeah. athletic version of Levi Wallace, right? Like he yeah. was like I, a little I, lengthier. I think what comes into it now though, like with what Levi went to Pittsburgh for, did he want to leave or did the Bills not want him anymore? Because he went for a very affordable deal that the Bills right. yeah, that's brought true. him back that's on. And the fact that he's gone, does that mean the Bills yeah. are like, all right, you know Maybe what? Maybe they're changing their way of thinking. Correct. They could be as well, much apparently as... Apparently the Bills chose a third down back in J.D. McKissick because apparently Brandon Bean was a little peeved because they would have spent that money that they used on J.D. McKissick on Levi Wallace. But I don't know. I mean, I feel like the Bills could have gotten maybe Brandon Bean's too stand up of a guy to go be like, hey, Levi, come back uh, after what Was uh, Washington did to him. But right. yeah, it I looked mean, like the Bills were willing to pass on Levi Wallace for a for a passing down back. So that looks like what the Bills were willing to sacrifice Levi Wallace for. So God also told him to go sign with the Steelers. So there's that. He had that working against us. Oh, he right. had that working against us. Um. All right, looking at some of these other corners, Damari Mathis, Anthony, you mentioned uh, Damari Mathis, or you're you're you sort of lit up a little bit when uh, I said his name earlier. I think he's a sneaky option. We've obviously drafted Dane Jackson and Damar Hamlin from that Pat Narduzzi defense over the past uh, couple of years. Damari Mathis, five foot eleven, one hundred ninety six. He had what a, a four three nine forty, so a pretty good forty yeah. time, showing off his speed. Uh, SIS. Lots of reps in zone coverage and press man in his time at Pittsburgh. They mentioned two of his top traits as closing speed and physicality. So the combination of reps in zone, pretty good in press man, closing speed, physicality. These seem like a lot of traits and tools and things that the Buffalo Bill or that he's done in his career at Pittsburgh. That the Buffalo Bills might see him transferring and building upon in the National Football League. Yeah, for sure. He... He he had a rep. It was the first one I saw from him as I started to dig into the process. He and it's kind of like who he is in, in a nutshell. He bites super hard on it's a slant and go and he bites super hard on the slant Ooh. to the point that when the receiver um, it's from the bottom of the screen going right to the left. So the receiver plants with his right foot inside and then pops it back outside to go upfield and Mathis is beat so bad. Like the receiver doesn't even have to swim him or go over him. Like he just goes completely by because there's so much separation and Mathis gets back in phase and takes an angle to the football combined with his speed and gets the pass breakup. He has no, I don't care if it's a college receiver, a college quarterback, whatever, he has absolutely no business getting back in to make this play and disrupt this. And I lit up like, Oh, Holy hell. And then started going down the Mathis, uh, the Mathis rabbit hole. So did Eric and uh, Eric Kendall and I were DMing about him a, a couple weeks ago when we were talking film room stuff. He's just, it's that scheme fit, right? Again, like the, like mm -hmm. you mentioned the, the pit secondary guys that her doozy defense and the comfortability factor of coming from that to the bills defense and the, the, to transition to that in the NFL, mm -hmm. but he's got speed. He's aggressive. He can hit. He, lays the wood in a variety of ways, whether it's in the hole against running backs, whether it's against mm -hmm. receivers, he punishes anybody who's got the ball and comes into his area. Like he, he's an easy sell because of that. Yeah. You see the speed, you see the athleticism. I think what's, what's good with him. And we haven't talked about it a lot in this episode, but there's a difference between time speed and game speed. He mm -hmm. plays fast. He is a quick trigger click and close detonate type of dude. And that's rare. The ability to go from zero to a hundred in about a second is very impressive with him. And you combine that with his ability to stay under control at times and just make these splashy, exciting electric plays. He's a really intriguing prospect. Now he's got to have that same type of Andrew Booth rein it in a little bit. Sometimes he will get too mm -hmm. aggressive and his overall body type, um, 
I don't know if it's necessarily corner NFL corner frame um, overall in terms of how his body is put together. And he's got to improve that route recognition or maybe just reduce that aggressiveness because he Mm -hmm. will bite on those double moves and routes that have multiple movements in the route stem. He will commit a little too early, but he's got that athleticism and the intelligence to be able to break and take angles to the football that gets him back in phase. It's going to be tough um, in the NFL level. But again, he, Kendall and I talked about him last week. This is one of those, like, you could do a lot worse than taking this traitsy, toolsy guy who's got mm-hmm. experience in your system and then bringing him into your system. Um, and then not on a negative note, I do not like Mario Goodrich. He gets beat vertical all day, mm-hmm. and I am not confident <laughs> whatsoever. He's very physical when he lays the boom every <laughs> once in a while, but no no for me. All right. Um, we have a super chat from Silas and Silas. I'm going to get to that super chat in one second. I just wanted to close out because those two guys are both in our sort of our next um, – tier of of corner so i'm gonna get to your super chat in one second uh please don't think i forgot it. i just want to close out with martin emerson here kendall give me like a quick one minute wrap up on martin emerson here he's a guy bills are bringing him in obviously for a um top 30 visit so there's clear interest six foot two 201 pounds i think he had a really good year in 2020 he's known for his zone coverage he's known for his length in his frame he's known for his physicality but SIS has his three weaknesses here as change of direction, ball mm-hmm. skills, transition quickness. They're so down on him that they have him as their 37th graded player, 37th yeah, graded corner. Right. Uh, and he did get cooked this year by the Jameses and the Mechies of the world and the Traylon Burkses. He got some of those t- upper tier SEC receivers this year. He struggled a little bit. Now, that wasn't the case in years past, but it was the case this year. What are your thoughts? Give me your like one, two minute summation of Martin Emerson's game. So the biggest thing with Martin Emerson is that he's an archetype and a scheme fit. He he fits Mm -hmm. everything the bills should be looking for on that side of the ball at that position. It makes a lot of sense. I agree with the suspect change of direction skills, uh, but you're, you should expect that from a bigger, longer, lengthier dude. And even with that being said, it's sufficient. Mm -hmm. It's not like it's a liability, but it is what it is for someone with his size. Um, he's got good footwork footwork for someone with that length. I like his back pedal. I like how he puts his foot in the dirt and then closes on the football when he recognizes the route. I really like that with him. I think the hip fluidity thing is solid. I I, like, I think it's sufficient. I don't think it's a liability at all, but I I definitely think it's something that could use some work. Uh, I already said the closing ability, great length. Something that I really loved about him was his zone communication skills. The way he passes off routes Mm. in zone, he's very, aware of everything that's going on around him he can see routes coming into his zone he can see routes leaving his zone and he's very quick to communicate with his teammates about it one of my Mm -hmm. favorite things though um on top of run support and how he actually uses his length and strength like it's one thing to have it but you got to use it and like actually disengage from blockers he can do that Mm -hmm. but he learned from his mistakes mid-game i wish i put a timestamp in here with the game that i knew that it was from but i have a note that there was a game that he made a mistake on a similar thing and he corrected it on the same exact concept later in the game. You love to see someone that's learning within the same game. It doesn't take a film session during midweek practice for him to learn from his mistake. He can go to the sideline, one drive that the offense is on the field. He's with his coaches. He talks about it. He understands what he has to do the next time he sees it. He processes it. He recognizes it and he fixes his, his mistake. So I love Emerson's game because it's a fit and all of those areas that you could call inadequacies or weaknesses or what have you, they're areas that the Bills just need to coach up. Mm. And that's why he's probably going to fall in round three, round four area of this draft as is. They're they're going to have some faults. That's what guys fall in the draft for. We're not talking about him as a round one, round two guy. He's going to have some areas that he needs some coaching, Mm. but I think he's, you could do a lot worse than him in the third round. I think he fits what the bills want to do on defense really well. And he's a great press man corner for all the love he gets in zone. He, he will be able to operate and press man. And we talk about the three wide three by one sets and that the bills will have Mm. to play man on one side of that he could operate and press man on that side and allow the safety to have some more time to travel over top of him and cover the area on top of him. So I love Martin Emerson and his fit for the bills. All right. We're going to get to Silas. We're going to get to super chat right after this, but I just want to walk through the, the fourth and the fifth round draft board. And I actually like some of these guys that are in the fourth round. Who knows? There could be a run and a lot of these guys could come off the board in the third round. 
Uh, Josh Williams, Zion McCollum, these guys are projection over sort of college production, just some freaky small school guys from Fayetteville State, Sam Houston State. Kobe Bryant, sort of a very technically sound corner from Cincinnati. Marcus Jones, shades of Terrence McGee. I want to talk about that in a little bit there. From the University of Houston, a smaller, more diminutive boundary corner with kick and punt return flex. Uh, Dave's guy, Monteric Brown from Arkansas. My guy, Jalen Armour Davis from Alabama, which I can't wait to have a conversation about. Uh, then as you get into like the later parts of the fifth round, Caleb Evans from Missouri, a good size prospect with some traits. Darion Kendrick, who's tumbling down draft boards from the University of Georgia with a, just an awful pre-draft process testing wise. Jalen Watson, who a lot of people think might have to go to safety. Josh Job from mm -hmm. Alabama. Kalon Barnes from Baylor, two guys that Silas mentioned in his super chat. So we're going to get to the second. And then my guy, Cardell Flott, the, the nickel corner uh, from LSU. So I want to start with Silas' super chat. And again, Silas, apologies for taking so long to get to it. Just we were three or four minutes off uh, from, from this just aligning perfectly. So I held off just a little bit. But he says, remember Hyde's interception versus New England? Louis Vi got cooked on that play. I hope he does well in Pittsburgh. But what do you think of Josh Job? or Kalon Barnes. I'm going to start off by saying I'm not in on either of them. I don't like either of them. I think Kalon Barnes is all speed and nothing else. And I think Josh Job is the stiffest MF or I've ever seen. Uh, and he get cooked a ton this season, but I'm going to go around the horn and Dave, I'll start with you. Josh Jobs, Kalon Barnes, either of these guys, I'm going to say fifth round for both. If they go before that, kill me, like just kill me. Uh, <laughs> <Jeez>. <laughs> And it's very rare that there are prospects that I don't like in this draft. Yeah, it right? is. He really means it. I was going to say, he... you like everybody. I can't believe you're <laughs> No, he means it when he says uh, this stuff. <laughs> Dave, Josh Jobs or Kalon Barnes, either tickle your fancy. If I had to pick one, it would be Barnes. But what, what do you think, Dave? Yeah, I, I kind of I'm with you. If I had to pick one, it would be Barnes. Obviously, he ran the 4 2 3 40 at the combine. But as Anthony said, like you got to have game speed. Mm -hmm. And overall, testing wise, even with that 4 2 3 40, he didn't he didn't actually come out with like a super great RAS score at the end of it. It was like a no, six point something. So he was very weak in all the other, or mm -hmm. I should say most of the other testing categories. Um, the comment from, from Keith over at TDN was that he'd be best served to go into a defense defensive scheme that runs zone. Um, and obviously from Baylor. So you can't discount the connection possible connection there, mm -hmm. but um, uh, yeah, I mean, when I was diving into, I mean, there's so many guys to dive into. Uh, yeah, the straight line speed, great, but neither of these guys were, as you said, uh, yeah. tickling my fancy. <laughs> we got John Coran quickly coming in with the super chat. He's a, a nice donation here. Appreciate it, John. Thank you as always to uh, anyone who um, you know just helps us, helps us, you know, helps us along. We appreciate uh, the donation. So thank you, John. I always appreciate your contributions in the comment section, uh, Anthony. Kalon Barnes, Josh Job, anyone, any one of these guys tickle your fancy, even the least bit. I mean, Job, I guess a little, just because if you're a consistent starter for multiple years for Nick Saban, I feel like at some level you're doing something good at football. Mm -hmm. Um, but overall, not tremendously. I feel like um he lacks burst or I guess maybe suddenness with that like quick trigger. I didn't really see it a lot. Um, he is competitive, he's aggressive in coverage you know again he plays that nick saban mm -hmm. style of defense and he fits and works with it um i mean again with all these types of guys like barnes is fast as hell like tilt mentioned but i think he lacks like the technique piece in terms of you know being a reliant corner and i feel like he rely i mean as fast guys do even something like, some of the guys we mentioned earlier like cam taylor Britt. like i feel like he relies on that speed too much and so I feel like the floor for his technique is very low and you're hoping that you can increase that trem tremendously. Mm -hmm. I guess it's all right. If you're taking him on the back end of the draft, if it's someone you want to take a flyer on, I think Joe mm -hmm. is the safer of the two because of a more like pro ready type of guy. Barnes is perhaps the more traitsy. I'm not mm -hmm. targeting either, but I'd be okay more with someone like a Job, given the kind of pro readiness that he potentially maybe uh, may possess coming from Bama. Yeah, he to me to me, Job is he's a Job. He's a Job from Arrested Development. <laughs> I don't, I don't. It's gonna I mean, be clowning out there on the mobile. Field. Uh, no Kendall, job, what do you Job's think? Okay. If you had to go with Josh Job or Ken, uh, Kalon Barnes, who, who are you who are you rolling the dice on? 
I, I, I literally haven't watched a critical eye on either of them. So mm. I'll take the fast guy, Kalen Barnes, <laughs> and we can move on. We can move on uh, to our next cornerbacks. <laughs> all right. So the next two guys, or actually the, the next thing I want to talk about was Dave's guy. Dave, you mentioned that you would be willing to take this guy in the third round. That's Monteric Brown from Arkansas. He's had a virtual uh, visit over Zoom or Skype or whatever program they are using at One Bills Drive. Uh, but they've had a virtual type of meeting with Monteric Brown out of Arkansas. What do you like about Monteric's game? Well, he reminds me kind of of a, of a player, players of the Bills would be interested in, right? Like solid in kind mm -hmm. of all facets. Um, he's not particularly deficient in anything that I've seen, but he's not particularly flashy either in anything. He kind of reminds me a little bit of Dane Jackson in that way, but he did test what well, really well athletically or not really well athletically. So that gives you pause for concern. I just feel like scheme versatile can play man or zone ran what he needed to ran, run at the combine. He's obviously way down the list at four, five, five, but that's mm -hmm. not what you were. That's not what you were getting him for, mm -hmm. right? You're getting him for the fundamentals and for his ability to be a little versatile. So I'm willing to, I, I would say, I think the third round is early for him, but I'd be willing mm -hmm. to take a chance on him in the third round. If like the, the draft had been like pretty depleted from some of these other mm -hmm. guys we had already mentioned, like and yeah. if you wanted to go into day three by having that guy, um, I wouldn't mind it. Now there is a guy on this list that I would take over him, Ooh. but, uh, but that's for another reason. It's for a yeah. totally different reason. So uh, I'll, stay, I'll, I'll save that. Uh, I'll tell you what, you, I, I'm rubbing off on you. You know, we've been working together so long that I'm rubbing off on you. I told you, I usually have a, like a route. I usually will take a guy like a round higher than they should be taken because I fall in love with them. I have mm -hmm. the same problem in fantasy football. I think you, I think you might be falling into that trap with Monterey Brown. I think I, I'm I rubbing think off on am. you a little bit. I probably I am. But there is a guy, you. there is a guy. I would say nine times out of 10 on the Ooh. fourth, fifth round list that I would take over him. All right. I want to have a little conversation here about Marcus Jones because, um, gosh, shades of Terrence McGee, you know, he looks the part, but he's got such a diminutive stature. A lot of people are like, well, he's got to move inside because of his stature. He's got to move inside because of his stature. But I, I just, you watch him play and like every single, you know, film study tape person that I follow that I've seen break down Marcus Jones's game is like, no, he's got the ability to play on mm -hmm. the boundary. But I think you are concerned at that size about his ability to hold up to me. Marcus Jones's perfect role in the national football league would be as your number one kick and punt returner and your CB four who can give you a little bit of nickel if you need it can give you a little boundary if you need it, be like sort of a stopgap starter, but maybe never have to play a full season as a starter. Am I too low on Marcus Jones with that projection? Because that's what makes me only put a fourth round grade on a Marcus Jones. Whereas if I felt like he could be an every down boundary corner, I'd move him up around into the third round. And I think there's a really good chance that he could go in the third round. Am I too low on Marcus Jones sort of prognosticating his future as an actual defender in the national football league? Kendall, you sort of, uh, you know, nodded when I, when I talked about his ability to play on the outside, what are your thoughts on Marcus Jones? I mean, the tape tells you that he, he will stand on the outside. Like he can do it. It's functional. It's not like mm -hmm. it's something he's, he's liable to do. He he can do it, but that size comes into question. The arm length comes into question. How far can your athleticism get you at the next level? Will you be able to hang with those guys? If, you know, you're asked to press at the line of scrimmage. Will you even be asked to press at the line of scrimmage? Mm -hmm. All of these kind of things, you get limited in what you can ask him to do at the next level simply because of his size and his length. But when he's asked to do something, he does it. He is so sound in what he does. He's so athletic. He can mirror match with anyone on the field. He can jump with anyone on the field. He is just the most athletic guy. Honestly, I was, I charted a lot of AAC football this year. I'm like pretty close to saying he was the most athletic football player in the AAC this past year. And that's up with, you know, Calvin Austin's of the world, anyone on Cincinnati. Like he was, he was really up there in athleticism. He's a really special athlete, but yeah, where is he going to fit? 
And that's the biggest concern. That is the mm -hmm. biggest concern with him because the tape will tell you that he can play anywhere you'll ask him to play, but where is he going to have the most longevity with his career? And I think that's the biggest question. Anthony, what are your thoughts on Marcus Jones? I So I went back and pulled up uh, my notes. I'm so glad I didn't have to speak before Kendall so that way I could grab my notes. <laughs> I, I studied Marcus Jones early in the offseason. I was excited as hell for our film room on the senior bowl. And I had Marcus mm -hmm. Jones all queued up and then he ended up not uh, participating. He had a lot of stuff going on this off season. I am a big fan of Marcus Jones. He won the Paul Horning award as the most versatile player in college football. Um, that fits. Average 29 yards per kickoff return and 13 and a mm -hmm. half per punt return. He has nine career return touchdowns, six on kickoff, three on punt, which is tied for the NCAA record. He is the best return man in college football coming out in this draft. He's electric. He's explosive. And you see that electricity and that explosivity on the outside in coverage with regularity, like his hip fluidity, his speed, his burst, it shows up on underneath routes regularly. His tape against Calvin Austin at a time when everyone was talking about how fast Calvin Austin is and how good of a route runner Calvin Austin is. My biggest takeaway from the Houston Memphis game was that Marcus Jones is sweet and how he matched yep. up against Austin time and time again. That being mm -hmm. said, I do question despite how fast and athletic and twitchy and bursty he is, I think he is susceptible to vertical routes. I don't know if it's his stride or maybe long speed potentially, um, but he will get beat from time to time deep. Um, and that happens. I shouldn't even say time to time. It's not a regular thing, but it happens with some regularity. Mm -hmm. um, I think honestly, and I hate to be that guy because I'm, I'm not a size guy. I don't think he has the size to live on the outside in the NFL. He's basically about five, eight, under 180 pounds at like 175, 177, yes. and he has the short arms. I love his speed. I love his athleticism. I think if he's your fourth corner, that's solid overall. I think he has a start or a shot to be a starting nickel guy um, in the NFL, and then he's your return guy as well. And I think based on – he's going to fall somewhere on the board based on who needs nickel and who wants that type of dual-purpose athlete. Um, not mm -hmm. similar to Elijah Molden last year, but you had a lot of teams where it was like, where's Elijah Molden going to go? And it's like, well, whoever really needs a slot corner and how they value slot corner like that. I think Marcus Jones can play in this league. Worst case scenario, you take him and he has the chance to be an all pro returner week in right. and week out. Mm -hmm. And then I think he also has a shot to be a starting nickel in the NFL. And it's a shame because of how athletic he is. Like mm -hmm. it's really impressive, but I just, mm -hmm. at some point, being like five, eight and 170 something pounds. Yeah. Like wh what do you do when you come up? Like if he covers Gabriel Davis, like what happens? Mm -hmm. Like it, yeah. and those guys, those guys are legit in the NFL. And that's the thing. Like, reminds I, me of that guy from Boise state last year. The Avery guy who Williams. Went to Atlanta. Yeah. Mm -hmm. in, in a he was, Avery way. Williams was a little bigger, I think. Yeah, he was. Yeah. But skill set wise, I, I feel like there's a lot of similarities. And there. the reason why I compliment Terrence McGee is because obviously the kick in the punt return ability and Terrence McGee was five foot nine and played boundary corner, but he was also five foot nine, like almost 200 pounds. So he had like 20 pounds more than mm -hmm. a guy like, um, you know, a guy like Marcus Jones, but the only comparable I can see in the NFL right now is DJ Reed five foot nine, one eighty eight, And even that's still 15 pounds Yeah, uh, who yeah. just signed a pretty lucrative contract with uh, the Jets. So yeah, it's tough to sort of, try to prognosticate and predict Marcus Jones's uh, future there. Was he the one you had over Monteric Brown there, Dave? Was he the one? Mm -hmm. He was the one? He, I talk, mean, look. Talk on it. Talk on well, it. Well, I mean, these guys hit on so many of the, the great talking mm -hmm. points already, right? I mean, Anthony talked about the, the career return TDs, right? He had four return TDs alone just last year, two on kicks, two on punts, um, and even played a little receiver as well, right? So, like, you talk about like, I mean, probably not going to be the case it, it, at the next level, but like, it's a guy that you want the ball in his hands. And mm -hmm. we're talking about a guy that pr played defense, right? So, um, graded out as a top 10 corner for, P for PFF the last two years. Now that's a, as a slot corner, I believe if, if I'm reading their grading correctly, but, um, his life basically in the NFL, I would have to agree with Anthony is probably at best going to be a slot corner. But at the same time, if you're getting a full-time kick and punt returner that you know is going to be your bona fide kick and punt returner, knowing his prowess in that area, like mm -hmm. we talk about getting kick and punt returners on this team, right? We talked about it last year. We like, okay, we like drafted Marcus Stevenson. We had Isaiah McKenzie. Like 
there was, there's always a discussion around like, well, who's going to win that job and who like this guy had some production in college. Now Marcus Stevenson was a very decorated kick returner in college, but he is not even in the same realm as Marcus Jones as a special mm -hmm. teamer. Right. And so you, you set and forget that as your kick and punt returner for the next, however many years. And if he gives you anything on defense, it's kind of a bonus. He can be your, mm -hmm. at least to start with, he can be your backup slot, backup true slot to Taryn, which I mean, at this point, let's be real. Like it's who, who, who is it? Cam Lew like, yeah, who is weak. it? Mm -hmm. Like, mm -hmm. and so he gives you that. And then if you want to like mix in a package or for or two for him on offense, maybe you could. If, <laughs> if Isaiah McKenzie, you know, if he's gone in two years, you sign him to your deal. Like that'd maybe, be wild. I, I'm just saying there no, are a lot it's, of possi it's possible. There are a lot of possibilities mm -hmm. and the athleticism is insane that yeah. it's almost like you get him in the, in the building and then you kind of figure it out. And at worst, he's your kick and punt returner and he could mm -hmm. be an all Okay, and he's got ball skills too. Like he had 10 yeah. career interceptions and, it's and he had five like, picks last year. There you go. Like, and, and, and they're not yeah. like fluky, like deflected off the linebacker and Oh, look like what fell into my hands. Yeah. Like he makes plays on the ball. Like, yeah. and you see some of that offensive background and his ability to attack and make plays on the ball mm -hmm. from a defensive perspective. He is a, he's a playmaker, whether he's on defense, whether he's in special teams, he's a playmaker who's mm -hmm. fast. And, and like, he's kind of got a little bit of that Taron Johnson, um aggressiveness in the run game too now he, yeah that's never going to work for him at the, like he's <laughs> never going to survive like his shoulders are going to be dead in like a year yeah, if, he, if he tries to pull it but he like he's no fear right and for a guy mm -hmm. that size to make it in the league you have to right you have to have no fear mm -hmm. yep. and yep. so he's just super exciting and it's like he would be a guy that like in the right spot if you drafted him it would be, it would just be really fun to have a guy like that on your team. The, the next two guys. And like I said, I, there, there's still like three more names that we got to talk about as guys who I think are legitimate, like really good, solid cornerbacks in this draft that like sort of get me excited. The next two I'm going to lump together here, Joshua Williams, the cornerback from Fayetteville state had the senior bowl invite small schooler and Zion McCollum from Sam Houston state. Another guy who had a senior bowl invite from a small school, both of these guys tested really well. It's sort of that projection over production. Zion McCollum was the number one rated cornerback in Raz's history. Uh, out of 1,923, he scored a perfect 10, had an elite Raz score. His only knock is 30.75 inch arms. Everything else, he tested elite. His size grade, six foot two, 200 pounds, elite. His explosion grade with a 40 inch vert, uh, 1,100 broad, elite. His speed grade, 4'3", four, 4'3", four, three, three, 40, 2'5", 20 yard split, 1'4", 10 yard split, elite. His agility, 3'9", 4 shuttle, 6'4", cone, elite. This guy was literally the number one tested, one of the number one, probably number to me, number one behind Jordan Davis, number two behind Jordan Davis of all the players at the combine. Just absolutely blew it up. And then you have another guy, Josh Williams, who I was chatting with him in his, in his DMs. He retweeted one of my, you know, clips of him and we were having a conversation. He met with the Bills at the Senior Bowl and they followed up at the Combine. He said they were very informal, but the Buffalo Bills have had some talks with him. 941 Raz. This is a guy with 33 inch arms, six foot two, 195 pounds. He's got a four, five, three, 40, but he's got a really good 10 yard split at one, 1. 1.5. Didn't do the agility drills, had a pretty decent, you know, good explosion gray with a good vert and a good broad. These are two guys who I think are worth a flyer. I wouldn't go earlier than the fourth round. Mm. Uh, like again, I think they fall right into that Spencer Brown type of ter territory. And I'd be really more comfortable if they were the second cornerback drafted, if we already drafted right. one. Yep. Um, but at the end of the day, like if we swing and miss and the board just does not fall our way in the first two or three rounds, and a Joshua Williams or a Zion McCollum is sitting there in the fourth round. If we have to take one of those stealing guys and then sign a Joe Hayden or a Br Br Bryce Callahan, Br Bryce Callahan, yeah, we're an hour and 45 in them, you know, slurring my words at this point. I'd love Bryce Callahan. <laughs> He's fantastic. Uh, but if we had to just sort of, you know, you know, pair one of those guys up with the higher ceiling guys, I'd be all for that as well. Anyone have any sort of takes on these really high ceiling uh, McCollum, Josh Williams type of, of players? 
I'll speak on McCollum. Um, I watched him. His tape is limited, but I watched him at the Senior Bowl, uh, the practices that week. Mm-hmm. He's easy to pick out because he's got that sweet orange helmet, and not a lot of teams have orange helmets. And I was like, boom, there he is. Um, I also – that's a really underrated thing. I like when I can watch tape. And I know exactly where the player is because they either yes. dress uniquely or they wear a <laughs> unique number. And I can be like, boom, because sometimes the film quality isn't great and it could be grainy, but I can know where someone is. Um, McCullum was one of those dudes. I mean, but you hit it like the athleticism, the speed, the 4.340. I think it also, if I'm correct, I think he's got like 13 interceptions in his career, which is impressive. Mm-hmm. Um, I think the big thing for me with him and you saw it in a senior bowl week, like I think he's used to winning because he's the best athlete on the field time and time again. And the higher you get in college and the higher you get, obviously when you make that jump to the NFL, you're going to have to adjust your technique in terms of how you approach different guys, whether in press, whether in off, but I mean, he's got the size, he's got the speed, um, you know, from reports and, and, and things, he's got a decent pattern matching background. So that would obviously mm-hmm. fit the bills, uh, mm-hmm. in, in my estimation, yeah. given what they do on defense, but you got an athletic guy, big, fast ball skills, some pattern matchability to him used to be in the best athlete on the field. Again, what we, this is like the. 75th guy we've said this for this show like mm-hmm. you can do a lot worse than getting this like treatsy toolsy person and then trying to coach him up and you're not really how much blood do you have to squeeze from the mccullum stone for me like given yeah. how traitsy and toolsy he mm-hmm. is like it might not be that hard um he's the one i would go for again my tape on both is limited at this point so my sample size isn't the highest a lot of it mm-hmm. just comes from that senior bowl tape but um the physical tools are very intriguing for both um but mccullum for me as well your boy Lettuce says you don't need to worry about fancy cornerbacks when you have the punt god sticking them inside the five. And hey, the only punter <laughs> the Bills have talked to you at this point that we have uh, knowledge of. I'm sure they're talking to Stout and Kamara and all them, but un- until we get it confirmed, he's the only the only punter we've talked to. Uh, we've only we've talked to at this point. So, um, all right, well, let's see what other players do I have here. I got a couple more. Number one, Kobe Bryant. Uh, great name. We got a lot of NBA names in this draft: Chris Paul, Kobe Bryant. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, Zion. Yeah, there we go. Not sexy measurables, but he just sort of fits. I think what Sean McDermott likes to do it was it was Bruce Nolan, Bruce exclusive on Twitter who said like Kobe Bryant is just a Sean McDermott type of corner. Kendall, would you agree with that assessment on Kobe Bryant from Cincinnati? Yeah, he doesn't have any true weaknesses. He just does everything at least at a solid level that you can mm-hmm. you can work with. I, I think there's a lot to his game that's very intriguing. He's comfortable in zone. He's got the length, not necessarily like lengthy, but you know he passes the the threshold of thirty inch <laughs> arms. So that's always nice. Um, <laughs> he's over six feet tall. He ran sufficiently four point five four forty. He had some work on special teams for Cincinnati, which is always a plus considering he has no guarantees to just walk in and be CB2. And if he isn't, then he'll contribute mm-hmm. on special teams. So that's always nice. But yeah, the the zone presence is really a big thing with him. He understands how to use the boundary to his advantage and kind of keep that on his back and force wide receivers to go inside of him. So he always has a view of the receiver. And then... um He's really comfortable in off in off coverage. Yes. And that's something Levi Wallace talked about a lot, uh, how he had to learn a lot of that from Trey, how he had to get comfortable in off coverage because he was so comfortable in press. And I think that's the opposite with, with Kobe Bryant. He's kind of suspect in his change of direction skills at times. He's very fluid in terms of his movements, like I guess hip fluidity wise, but when he's asked to make short bursty twitchy movements, he's not always there. So I think that's a big thing with Kobe Bryant, but like he, you're not going to find him operating in the slot all that well. You're not going to find him operating mm-hmm. in press coverage all that well because it's going to take him time to recover. But um, I think he operates really well in off man where he can see everything in front of him and then use his closing speed and his ball skills to go up and break up passes. Cause he's, in my opinion, he's up there probably like top five, top 10 area in terms of ball skills and closing speed. He's really good in those two areas. Yeah. Uh, last one I want to talk about here before we move on to like just sort of like later round guys is Jalen Armour Davis. I think this is a guy who could easily go maybe in the third round. I think he comes off the board at least somewhere in the fourth round. Uh, fast riser from Alabama. He's a fourth year sophomore. Hasn't seen the field a ton. Just really one year of playing time at Alabama. But 
you look at his strengths, uh, SIS uh, sort of highlights his three strengths as natural mirror and match abilities, yes. fluid movement skills, speed and athleticism. And I read those three things and it says to me, that is a Buffalo Bills type of corner or the traits that a Buffalo Bills team would look for. I can see a guy like Jalen Armour Davis at six foot one, 197 pounds, even though he played at Alabama. Again, more projection than production, even though he did get that one year of production as a starter. Kendall, you 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 started looking at him today. What are your thoughts on Armour Davis? Yeah, that mirror match thing. Like, that's it. Like, he rarely gets out of phase. The dude is always in phase. His footwork is so clean that everything in terms of his testing, like, when you look at his testing numbers, you see that he ran fast, and you can see that he can always stay in the hip pocket with guys. But you see some suspect mm. explosion grades and, and agility grades, but you don't see that on tape. Like, he has the change of direction skills on tape to – be reactive with what the wide receiver is doing and always stay in their hip pocket. He's so good at staying in phase. He's comfortable and press, which is really encouraging because of that thing I mentioned about the safety, giving the safety time to get over top. And then he's comfortable and off reading, reading the route in front of him, reading the hips of the wide receiver, knowing when to break on the route, break on the football. He's got good ball skills, not great ball skills, but good enough mm -hmm. where you're not worried about it. He can make a play on the football, but I'm only a game and a half in right now. I feel comfortable with like a fourth round ish grade. It's yeah. fluid right now. Cause I'm only a game and a half in, but I love what I saw from him. I think he's very yeah. intriguing and I think you know the bills have a link to Alabama corners mm -hmm. in Levi Wallace. So I think you could do a lot worse as we've said I, for, I eight think he's, now. I think he's just such a sleeper in this draft class. And I think, I think he's gonna be one of the really, really late risers in this process. Uh, looking at some of these corners, Caleb Evans, I know, uh, Kendall, you did a breakdown of him, Darion Kendrick, Jalen Watson. We've already talked about Joe Barnes and Flott. uh, going into the sixth and seventh round to Castro fields out of Penn state, Gregory jr. Uh, Dukubi Durant. So you got some, and again, Sam, Sam Webb more a continual. That's a theme this year. Toolsy small schoolers uh, is a huge theme this year. Mikhail Wright, who's got a little bit of punt return flex from the University of Oregon as well. Jack Jones, who's also got punt, retex, but punt return flex, but a sort of a diminutive stature corner from Arizona State. Josh Thompson from Texas. Chase Lucas. Here's another theme. Punt return flex from Chase Lucas out of Arizona State. Isaac Taylor Stewart out of USC. Sean Jolly out of App State. Matt Hankins out of Iowa. Damarion Williams out of Houston. Daryl Baker Jr., to Marcus Fields, Chris Steele out of USC. There's a couple I didn't even mention. I think their measurables make them go undrafted. A guy like Jermaine Waller, who could be this year's Levi Wallace, uh, an undrafted player who really um, sticks on a team and might even be able to start at some point in this league, uh, despite the fact that he doesn't have great measurables. Uh, he's my notable UDFA, him and Vincent Gray from uh, um, Michigan, blanking on the name of the school there. Uh, any guys late, Dave? I'm going to start with you. Who are some of these guys later in the draft that the Buffalo Bills were maybe to take a swing at a second guy? Yep. Uh, what is uh, what, what are some guys that you're taking a swing on here? Yeah, I'll hit on three guys that I like. Um, Isaac Taylor Stewart, which I think I'll let Kendall speak more to him uh, as far as the film, but obviously he's been tabbed as one of the you know best pure athletes at the position. Mm -hmm. So when you're talking about late round talents and you're talking about what do you look for in a late round guy, well, you – either look for someone who's got a really good athletic profile, look at someone who's really good at one niche skill or something, right. That you can hang your hat on. And he's got, you know, he's obviously got the athletic profile and coming from, you know, obviously a decorated program in U USC, but Josh Thompson and Sam Webb are the other two guys for me that mm -hmm. kind of intrigue me, right? Josh Thompson, um, you know, he's known as more of the sort of come up in, in, in your face, like run stuffing type corner, but then he runs a four, four at the combine and you're like, well, he, maybe he's more than just, you know, a tackling corner. Um, he's a big physical style, willing to come up and get dirty in the run game. And he's primarily his own player at Texas, right? So, um, he's the leader. He was the, one of the leaders on that Texas defense. Um, and he tested well athletically, right? He had a 9.55 Raz. Mm -hmm. Um, the ball skills aren't necessarily, his calling card. He only had seven career passes defense to Texas, but um, he is someone that intrigues me physically. And if the bills wanted to go a direction more to a more physical brand of corner, he would be the guy that would interest me. And then Sam Webb is the other one from Missouri Western. Um, obviously playing at a lower level of competition, but 
9.4 RAS. So he tested well athletically. He's got length, athleticism, ball skills. Um, SIS describes him best fit in his zone, which would obviously be something the Bills could look at and could be a contributor on special teams early. Um, they have him ranked as the 32nd best corner, which given you know the number of corners in this draft and the fact that he's from Missouri Western is not all that bad or unfair mm -hmm. of a rating, I feel like, for Sam Webb. Um, so, I mean, look, there's tons of guys on that, that list, right. That, you know, Anthony and Kendall are going to get to too and yourself, but those are just three, I would say that stand out to me, Isaac Taylor, Stewart, Sam Webb, and, uh, Josh Thompson from Texas. Kendall, how about you? I know you did some, some work on a Caleb Evans from Missouri. I, I like him as like, I, I think a Caleb Evans, like he, I had him as sort of my projection of the fifth round, but I wouldn't be surprised if a team pulled the trigger on him. If there's a run on corners, he goes earlier, like fourth round. A guy like a Caleb Evans out of Missouri, he's got the size. So that's the thing. When I was watching him, I was thinking fourth round too. I would kind of elevated him up to fourth round. But then as I wa started watching more of these later round guys, I think mm -hmm. he'll probably settle in in the fifth round. And I think that's yeah. probably good for him. Um, he's got the length. He's got the strength. He's got the size to match up in zone. Played a lot of bail technique in zone. So I couldn't get his true like pattern matching stuff that I wanted to see from him in zone. But got the length to play press uh he uses it well which is very encouraging uh he's got athleticism to the point where he doesn't get stacked very easily and if he does he has the length at the catch point to make it tough on the wide receiver to make that catch um but the biggest thing about him is run support he's not necessarily like very aggressive and very active in it but when he has the chance he's, he's good in terms of his run fills and he is he has the least missed tackle percentage of any cornerback in this draft class with qualifying snaps. He had like two missed tackles all year. He didn't miss his tackles. Mm -hmm. And part of that is due to length. I mean, you got to have length to make those arm tackles and it makes it easier to make those tackles, but he's very sound in his pursuit angles and he rarely gets uh juked out or anything like that. He was, he was very mm -hmm. disciplined in that regard in terms of run support. So I think he's, he's a good fit for this defense. He's a, a another guy I would look for as a tail end of the double dip. Mm -hmm. Any other guys sort of on that list of late rounders outside of Evans, maybe speak up on uh, Taylor Stewart a little bit or anyone else really stick out to you. Yeah. It's just for now. Taylor Stewart's the only one that I've done enough work on to speak to. So I, I like Taylor Stewart's athleticism and his shows on tape. Um, he doesn't get beat deep. He, he just doesn't. He has the speed to keep up with everyone. He he was caught wrong jumping on an out and up route and he fixed it immediately. He got right back in phase uh, jumping on the out portion of the out and up and was right back in the hip pocket of the wide receiver. So love to see that. He's got great change of direction skills. Um, you can see that in the run game and the pass game in terms of his mirror match ability. He's, he's great in terms of change of direction, staying in the hip pocket. And then in the run game, he uses the, the change of direction skills to avoid wide receiver blocks and yeah. then get in the backfield to make a play. So that's always encouraging to see him use it in various ways. Um, what is the last point on Taylor Stewart though? He's really, really good in off coverage. Like I, mm -hmm. I didn't see a lot of confidence in his press coverage, but he is so, so comfortable in reading routes from off coverage and then using that closing speed to break on the ball. He was very, very comfortable in off coverage. So I, I like his skill set. I like his athleticism. And I think the bills could definitely coach up those, those mm -hmm. areas that could use some sharpening or polish. Yeah. You double boy dip on the USC back to back years. <laughs> yeah, I know. Right. Uh, your boy lettuce comes in saying pair up McCreary and flat, obviously with, uh, with uh, Matt Ariza uh, sandwiched in between those picks there. Uh, so, uh, Anthony, any like late round guys, I, I, I know that, uh, you know, you've been busy working, grinding the tape, any of these late round guys you've had a chance to get to, you're a fan of their game. You, if it's a fan and from, from, from afar. Tariq Castro fields continues to be intriguing for me. He's got, he's got like a variety of grades from people. Some people think he's like a UDFA. Some people have him as like a third or fourth or fifth round grade. He's like all over the mm -hmm. place. And his tape is really interesting. Like the, the Ohio state game is, is such a microcosm of what he is. Like, they, I mean, they're loaded with Jackson, Olave and Garrett Wilson and just what they have at that position. But his, press coverage ability and his aggressiveness and his long speed showed up regularly against all three of those guys. And 
You see a lot of competitiveness from him. You see some physicality. Um, Mm -hmm. You see him display like NFL traits and then you see like inconsistency and the up and down. And he's somebody who I think ticks some boxes for the bills. And again, if you're looking late, like I think late fifth, sixth round type of thing. Again, if you took a corner early and it's like, Oh, let's take another guy. I think he's got, he's very mercurial. I think he's got not the highest floor or I'm sorry, not the highest ceiling, but I think he's got, a strong enough ceiling that he can be like a reliable, mm. like third man rotational corner. But the problem is he's going to have like that low floor. Like he could be out of the league in like, two <laughs> years, or he could be like yeah. a solid corner three um, mm-hmm. for a lot of teams and provide some depth on the outside, given his size and speed. And his tape wasn't, yeah. wasn't bad. I came, I came away impressed uh, with some of his tape and then concerned with some of his others, but he's a late round guy who uh, continues to stick in the back of my mind from what I've seen from the tape. Yeah, just a couple of late round guys that I want to touch on before we head out of here. Uh, someone mentioned in the comment section earlier, fifth year senior, so a little bit older of a prospect, but Matt Hankins from Iowa, six foot, 185. Those Iowa corners at Iowa pedigree. He played alongside Riley Moss this year. He tested Great like out. ass, though, athletically. He tested like ass, uh, <laughs> but, um, you know, so did Levi Wallace. So this is about probably the end. Of well, the he was like year. a one point something, <laughs> I think, or like two points. Um, you know, he's a guy who him and, and Riley Moss, who Riley Moss, I think, is the next Micah Hyde. I'm putting that out there right now. I mm-hmm. said that three, four months ago. I'll say it again. I wish he would have came out in this draft. He went back to Iowa. Uh, I think he's the next Micah Hyde. But uh, Matt Hankins was on the other side, tracks the ball well in the air. He's physical with receivers. He's a good run supporter. He's just a solid guy. Uh, yep. So I think he can be a Levi Wallace type at the end of the draft. Uh, if you're missing to say by chance, this is by chance. This is the by chance episode because I mentioned his guy, Cordell Flott, earlier in the show as a guy that we could take in the middle rounds as like a corner safety flex. Here's another guy who he just mentioned in the comment section, 50 year senior from the university of Houston. So Kendall, maybe you've seen a little bit of him watching Marcus Jones, Demarion Williams, um, mm. just a smart, heady player with ball skills, versatility. He's got nickel boundary safety flex, really high football IQ, good ball skills. Uh, but he is a fifth year senior at 5'10, 182. He's got sort of a little diminutive stature. So Demarion Williams is another guy that I really like later on in the draft. Uh, my guy, one of my favorite corners, he's been one of my favorite corners in college football for two years now. It pained me to make him a UDFA. Jermaine Waller from six at six foot one eighty from Virginia Tech, fourth year junior. He is Levi Wallace. Instincts, ball tracking, route recognition, but um, not great closing speed, not great change of direction ability. Just a very meh athlete. But I really like Jermaine Waller. Uh, and I'm gonna get off my pedestal here in a second. I got two more. Jack Jones, six year senior, USC transferred to Arizona state. He's another one of those guys who can be a punt returner and maybe a fourth or the fifth cornerback diminutive stature, five foot 11, 171. but he was a four-star recruit out of USC. Just if you, if you guys have a chance, just go watch Jack Jones at five foot 11, 171 play man to man defense. It is a thing. It is a sight to behold. He is feisty. He is physical. He is so confident in man coverage. He's got really good play speed. I'm a huge fan of, of Jack Jones, uh, despite the fact that he is a six year senior and he does have that diminutive stature. I think he'd be a perfect, like fifth, six DB who could also return punts. He did it a little early in his career. Then he was so well utilized on defense that they didn't, they stopped having him return punts and kicks, but he was doing it again at the East West shrine. So, you know, Judd, some teams want to see Jack Jones, maybe get back to that. And then last but not least, uh, I don't know much about this guy, but I saw that he was meeting with the New York Giants, which uh, I'm keeping an eye on who the New York Giants are meeting with. That's sort of maybe an indicator of who the Buffalo Bills like. This is a guy who I've seen some decent grades on him between the fifth and UDFA. Jasir Taylor from Wake Forest. Don't know much about him, just but just remember the name. Five foot ten, 186, uh, senior from Wake Forest. He met with the Giants, so that might give you. Uh, an indication that maybe the Buffalo Bills would be interested in. And then last but not least, Raleigh Tejada from Baylor. Uh, he's going to be a UDFA, but he's got those Dave Aranda connections. And I think uh, he's a guy who come into camp um, and be a camp body for the Buffalo Bills in the least bit. But that's my pedestal for the late round guys. I don't got anything else for those uh, for those late round guys. We are two hours and seven minutes in. So there's going to be no mock draft tonight, ladies and gentlemen. Sorry about that. We've got uh, we had a special guest, and we probably already kept him about forty-five minutes more than maybe he anticipated. Well, he knows the reputation. No, I expected. I he I knows full two hours. He knows how long we go here uh, during draft season on the air eight hours. So 
We're going to end it right there. Uh, for those of you who don't know, you can find Anthony on Twitter at pro underscore Anth. He will be doing the film room tomorrow night with Eric and Kendall. What are you guys doing tomorrow night in the film room, by the way? Ooh, top 30 doing... visits defense. Yeah. Ooh, top. Look at that. Guys, the Buffalo Bills have met with uh, breaking down the film of those guys. Top 30 visits for the defense. And then you got disguise coverage on Wednesday where you will also find Anthony. Anything special cooking for for Wednesday show? Yeah, I've got Nate Tyson from the Athletic. Ooh, we're going to talk about big promotion the, for Nate Tice, by the way. Yeah, he's fantastic. Um, he deserves every bit of what he's achieved and what he will continue to achieve. Um, yeah, he's going to be on. We're going to talk about the changing nature of NFL defenses um, and how the Buffalo Bills are built to combat that changing nature of NFL defenses and what they can mm. do in the draft to further that notion. Awesome. So. Thank you guys so much. Uh, really appreciate it. I mean, we 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 went two hours plus and had 200 people on the show almost the entire night. You guys are freaks and we love it. Um, yeah, I'll timestamp that by chance. So you can go back and you can listen <laughs> to that Cordell, Cordell Flott stuff uh, on demand. We talked about him at the, right at the beginning of the show. Uh, the the pre-draft visit tracker is now live on coverone.net. So you can head over to coverone.net and you can check out the pre-draft visit tracker. It's cool. been running... It's been running on the ticker. Uh, it's been running on the ticker the 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 entire show as well. Over forty visits that we figured out for the Buffalo Bills and uh, Daryl Hilliard comes in and says, "Is there going to be draft special on draft night or draft weekend?" Well, yeah, we got we got some stuff <laughs> cooking for you Thursday night. The air raid hour will be live, and we'll be bringing on all of the Cover One personalities. We'll have Eric, Aaron, and Greg live from Vegas. They will be doing stuff all over social media, probably on YouTube, smaller stuff um, because they'll be live in person, probably won't have all the technical equipment and stuff that uh, that we have here. But Anthony will be in studio. Kendall will be in studio. I know Anthony Romeo, uh, Sterling, all those guys, uh, Kevin and Mike will all be in studio with us. We'll be rotating throughout Thursday night, Friday night. And probably most of the we're all freaks. So probably most of the day on Saturday <laughs> as well. So cover one is going to have you covered literally from start to finish uh, for the NFL draft. So make sure you're tuned in to cover one uh, on draft night. I won't be there on Saturday. It's my wife's birthday. So I told her she gets, she gets so mad at me. Like uh, every year, like she doesn't know the draft is like, coming. Well, but I, I, so I was like, I was like, babe, after this year, we get like five years where like you, the draft doesn't fall on your birthday. So we're good. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> she's like she, she's like she gets so bad and i'm like uh, i'm sorry like you you signed up for this you knew exactly what what you signed up for but yeah i missed i'm i missed nights two and three last year i'm only missing the, i'm only missing day three this year yeah that's um, but you know you 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 sacrifice when you when you love someone hopefully she's watching right now she usually starts <laughs> to tune in she usually starts to tune in towards the end, like, where the hell is this guy? He, uh, he needs to come to bed. So uh, maybe she's listening. Babe, love you if you're listening. Um, so, ladies and gentlemen, that should be it for this evening. Thank you so much, uh, Anthony. As always, it's a pleasure. Love listening to you talk about hip fluidity. Um, I'm just going to start making those, like, TikToks, little, little segments of you just talking about hip fluidity. Uh, Kendall, pleasure as always. Dave, pleasure as always. I feel like, you know, I take you for granted a little bit at some points, but you know, you know, there's love, you know, the love is there. Mm. Uh, and until next time, ladies and gentlemen, I'm just talking on my ass at this point. Uh, until next time, ladies and gentlemen, go bills. Go bills. Go bills. Go bills. Are we having fun yet? <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>